Hello, everyone, and welcome to the FIDE Women's Candidates. I am Jennifer Shahadi, and I'm here today with Irina Crash for coverage of this exciting tournament. Irina, we are about to crown a semifinalist either today or tomorrow. Let's take a look at the bracket and see how they got here. Uh, we do have Anna Muzichuk versus uh, Lei Tingshea, and Anna got here by beating Humpy Canero in a very feisty match that went to um, tiebreak. Uh, Lei Tingshea, on the other hand, had a smoother road as she eliminated Anna's sister, Maria Muzichuk, in the classical games. Um, and I, Irina, um, today's match is between, of course, the winners of those two matches and we're in game four right now yeah i see the players um they greet each other in a very kind of um perfunctory way i didn't see a smile there um between them so they're really there for the business um and well that happens you know there's all kinds of relationships in chess you know there's the more friendly uh, rivalries and then there's just you know we're here to play chess and that's it and I felt like we saw that latter one Jen like really really quick handshake did not really see um like eye contact maybe I missed it but that was that was my impression um so they've played already three games against each other all of which have ended in draws um and actually is our one of our commentators our tours has pointed out he feels like um, the queen trades in these games were initiated by Anna and that perhaps that is not accidental. Perhaps that is like a match strategy, um, which is kind of surprising, Jen, because I think both of these players are kind of tactical, um, good in the middle games players. So it is a little bit surprising that we've seen the three end games coming out pretty early from the opening in all the games. Yeah, and I wonder if we'll see that again. I mean, last time they played with these colors, it was a Grunfeld. Um, they are sitting right now in Monte Carlo, Monaco, a wonderful venue for a chess tournament. You know, I played a lot of poker in Monaco, and it's just so quiet and idyllic. So it's a great place to win some money, win your spot to the world championship. We do have a prize fund of a quarter of a million dollars, including 60,000 euros for the champ. But of course, what's really up for grabs is that spot into the semifinals, which gets you one step closer to challenging Ju Wen June, the current women's world champion. And by the yes. way, the format, the format, if uh, if you haven't been watching, uh, well, you know, you got a lot to catch up on, uh, but it's a four game match and we're in the, the fourth game and the time control is. 90 minutes with the 30 second increment and they do get that bonus 30 minutes after 40 moves yeah so we will go to a tie break tomorrow guys um which uh has you know it's quite a long tie break with four rapid games and possibly a, blitz, a couple more blitz games um and well we'll see we'll tell you more about it if we get there the players have sh shaken hands there is a guest on site to make the first move and uh he is making i don't know the move d4 probably okay players are smiling for the cameras hey you could always play g4 f4 the bird yep well uh if magnus were the guest perhaps he would put g4 on the on the board but uh but he's not there I think Magnus. Wait, what? Is, yeah, somewhere in, in America, right? Because they have like the uh, the champ, the champions. Um, what is it? The fi finale of the Champions Chess Tour coming up uh, in San Francisco some, sometime this month. Oh, and there it is. It does look like we have our first move of the game, and it's a, a D four, I believe, which was the same move that she played in their second round game, which was a very uh, exciting Grunfeld, which kind of ended slightly unexpectedly in a repetition. Yeah, let's see what Anna is going to do. She went for knight f6. <clears throat> we don't have the moves yet coming up on the board, so just give us a second, guys. But we'll, yeah, she's uh, she's repeating. All right. So, I mean, that makes sense. It's kind of like what we've always seen so far. The players, once they've selected their opening, they are not going to change it for the second game. So Lei is thinking, and she goes for knight c3. And I, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so here we go. D4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, knight c3, and d5. And there was a trade. Now, if you don't play the Grunfeld, well, you know, give it a try. You might have some fun. But it might seem a little weird that you're just seeding the center so fully to white, right? Because e4 can be played and white just has a massive center, um, which at first might not be obvious how to counter that. But let's take a look at what they played. Did you play e4 here? Like yeah. you did in that first game. I'm trying uh, to see. Hold on. First of all, if I refresh the board, do we just, no, okay, we just, we don't really have the moves. Okay. I got to put back. Um, do you see the moves, John? Maybe you can take a look and tell me what happened I, after D5. I do think, I do see a queen on A4, by the way. And I see a, I, I think there's a queen, a queen A4 idea after E4, knight C3, B C3. Yeah, there is a move queen A4 right here. I agree. If only I could... Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's yeah. right. I so think it's that's right, right here. Right and so black is in check. Is that right, Jen? Yeah. I see that queen on a four. King's still on e eight. And this and... move has been has been played many many times, and it, it might come as a bit of a surprise to people because hey, you're playing queen a four check, and you know usually you could just reply to that with a tempo gaining move like bishop d seven. So what do you think the deal is mm -hmm. behind this? Behind this move, uh, note, note that one of the things that's cool about the Grunfeld for white is that you've mm -hmm. opened up the B file, right? So that B7 pawn is weak. So when you play Bishop DD7 here, which would seem like the move, if you're not acquainted with the Grunfeld, that would be like most instinctual. I get checked, I attack. Well, there's actually two possible moves. Like Irina wants to play Queen A3, which looks really good. Um, and indeed, like that will probably, will probably not happen because Anna, of course, did not play Bishop D7. But uh, queen a3 um, just allows us to really hamper black's development a little bit. We're going to put our work on b1, and we've got to kind of watch out for attacks against that e7 pawn as well. So um, instead, Anna didn't even play bishop to d7, and instead played knight to d7. Yeah, so I do know a little bit about this move. It's been used definitely by some good players. I'm pretty sure, um, I don't know, maybe even Carlson's is featured in his games. Um, the idea of this move is to force Black to put his pieces in a less than ideal way, right? So we, so we know in the Grunfeld, Black likes to castle, the pawn goes to c5, the knight goes to c6 for maximum pressure on the d4 pawn. When you play queen a4, um, if they go bishop d7, you go queen a3, they already have trouble playing c5. So this is kind of a, the point is that after queen a4, the queen often goes to a3 and hampers black from playing c5. Now, when they go knight d7, that's fine, but you know, the knight is not going to be on c6. So when they play c5, there's less pressure on this pawn. So there's definitely, I would say the idea of this move is to destroy black's harmony a little bit, not let him set up the pieces in the typical Grunfeld fashion that he's accustomed to. And um, do, yeah, knight d7, it's the last move that we have on the board right now. And so after knight to f3, which we expect. Oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's happened. Knight f3 castles bishop e2. Okay, we have knight f3 castles and bishop e2. Um, mm -hmm. The question for me is, um, we can still play for c5 even without our knight on c6, but mm -hmm. then we don't have as much. Then, of course, we don't have as much pressure against d4, which is a bit of a drag, right? Yeah. I, there are ideas like sometimes when the pawn gets traded there and there's like a pin there's always this tricky move knight c5 that you need to be aware of but of course um well in fact uh it's actually possible here you know now that i mention it it's just not it's just not very effective here because the queen goes back uh to c2 and you know there's no real point for the knight to be here but in terms of this relationship that is a square you always want to put atten pay attention to that's a great point because if the white bishop had gone to c4 or d3, d3 well, obviously yeah. d3, yeah, that would have been bad. Yeah. Knight c5, it would have been actually good for multiple reasons. In fact, because the queen uh, also uh, is is uh, providing some pressure on the d4, d3 squares. So bishop mm -hmm. e2, and now it's it's black on move. Besides c5, like 
it feels like she might be thinking about something like a6 to consider the move b5 and bishop b7 um yeah i like B5 this well. um, i like this decision by lay of course changing the line that she played in the first game not not a surprise for me probably not a surprise for anna that lay has decided to do something different um this line is definitely still less explored and it has it's a certain you know uh points so i've always been you know kind of interested by this early queen move um which again goes really against a uh, classical chess principles to develop your queen so early so anna goes knight b6 and by the way we can see that lay is a little bit better prepared than anna uh because she has not used up any time at all and anna at least has been thinking on this decision so she played knight b6 mm -hmm. here and now um Queen B4 quickly played, and uh, I think that uh, is Anna be, going for this. I think Queen I mean, D6, yeah, Queen D6. That's what I'm thinking. She's gonna play that to kind of like finish the uh, the quartet of queen trades. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I mean, it is one of the main ideas in the position, so I can't really blame her for no, thinking of it because. Can't blame her. Yeah, but I mean, is it really like like really out of all the choices you had, you're gonna go again for like the queen trade? interesting that she chose b4 instead of a3 because you know a3 is also um completely possible but i mean perhaps black can go queen d6 here and then white doesn't have to take because i'm not sure that black wants to take i think that really helps white's pawn structure but perhaps a move like a5 like maybe black will try to encourage white to make that trade but then yeah then white can actually go back somewhere on the b file and we can stay in the middle game now yeah i agree with that i love that idea irena keep those chess queens on the board we love to see them even right now i have a question like what if yeah. we just retreat retreat our queen because move e5 is could be coming I, positionally of course e5 does seed some important squares but uh it's not like we're not able to get a tempo against that queen bishop a3 is also on tap so oh yeah maybe queen b1 like, you want to do yeah yeah bishop a3 possibly even queen b3 with the idea of bishop a3 but then i guess you might have bishop e6 so mm -hmm. we'd have to check that kind of yeah. just like highlighting the weakness of my c3 square um yeah i anyway. guess the issue here is that i don't know if we want to play d5 so early right because normally you would like to answer with that move but um they might be going bishop g4 and um you normally if white would have time to develop and to castle and to get that pawn to c4 of course this would be quite nice for white but the problem is this move c6 is coming very quickly and yeah. i think white was induced into playing d5 a bit too early so um i guess not queen b3 but she could go back to b1, which makes a lot of sense. And then, um, well, I mean, then the game goes on. At least she avoided the queen trade. I love it, Irina. Queen b1, make it as hard as possible for Anna to trade queens. <laughs> Keep yeah. her in the back. Uh, we, we got some comments. Yeah. By uh -huh. the way, we've got we've got a lot of comments coming in uh, here on uh, our Twitch um reminder for everybody watching who's asking this will switch over in a little over an hour um, to the global chess champs and uh we will be going over to chesscom live so be sure to follow a uh, chesscom live as well squad stream for that switch over later in the meantime we do it following this one important pivotal game leaving us a lot of time for questions so if you have any questions about the grunfeld about these players about this event it's a perfect time to ask them Yep. And some of you guys are saying, okay, you're trying to make predictions about what's going to happen, who's going to win. Um, yeah, the one Lord God says, I think this will be a draw, guys. Don't be so optimistic. Well, certainly when they've made three draws already, it's quite, um, quite possible that trend will continue. Um, but I think we have a promising opening for now. So for now, we got nothing to really complain about. And I think we need a little, a few more moves at least to get a sense of how, where this game is going. Um, so if knight a4 defending the c5 pawn here, Jen, actually feels a little annoying because there is a lot of pressure 
on white center. So some position like that, I would be scared that white's uh, center is going to collapse once the rook gets to the C file. But let's see how white can try to hold things together, right? Um, you really want to get out of that C file. So maybe like that. Oh, by the way, we do have two moves, Irina. Queen d6 is on the board, mm. and um, Leighton Che quickly castle. That looked like that move came in quite quite quickly. In fact, she still has far more time than she began with. Yeah. So now the big question is, does Black immediately take on b4 um, and, you know, collapse our dreams of, a, of queens on the board until somebody promotes a pawn? Or um, is she going to play something like, developing move maybe bishop d7 um bishop g4 bishop yeah bishop somewhere and kind of like leave the tension um for the queen trade for later because it's one of those things that if white takes on d6 it does potentially help black's pawn structure so she might be keen to just kind of keep that queen trade tension yeah you know i have to say i am amazed that in four games there's like these queen trades coming so early. Like, I don't think it's an accident. It's just impossible to, to in, in four games um, that, that you cannot find uh, positions where the queens are not coming off the board. So it's obviously intentional, right, Jed? I mean, how else can we interpret this? Um, maybe. I mean, I think the thing about chess is that it's all, it's all uh, relative. So Anna might feel that you know, she's a great attacking player. She is, but maybe she still thinks that trading Queens is a good strategy against this particular opponent. So yeah, but that's not about, now, I guess lay lay also thinks that it's a, I mean, I, I mean, well, I mean, lay. Okay. Maybe she just like the line that we looked at with queen B one C five, maybe, maybe they just thought in their analysis that it wasn't much. So maybe that's why she's leaving the Queens on the, on B four. So let's talk a little bit about what this end game entails because it's quite possible that Anna will be going for that, right? So queen takes b4, c takes b4. Um, all right, so let's let's uh, let's just think here. What makes sense for us, Jen, in this not very tactical position, right? So there is bishop g4. There is a5 as like the more forcing moves that actually make threats. Uh, yeah, you like the idea. Moves. Mm -hmm. I do like the idea of trying to get a5 in because otherwise a4, a5 by white is a bit annoying because that knight on b6 becomes anchorless. Yeah, if you go a5, I guess you're making me play b5, right? So then the question is, who was helped by that? Because then this pawn is a bit weak and I can see myself going bishop a3, rook c1. Maybe, maybe, you know, Jen, so the issue here is really this pawn, because I did say, I did say that this pawn structure in general looks favorable for white. So from a purely, you know, you know, one second glance, of course, white's pawn structure is better. They have a lot of space, three pawns in the fourth rank, and there is no C5 break. So white has a space advantage that's undeniable. But so the question is, where is the counterplay, right? So let's try... Well, bishop g4, I mean, I think bishop e3, someone's got to protect that pawn. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And Jen, you know, when they take, right, uh, we can actually do our typical Grunfeld thingy, which is like that. Don't we see that a lot in the Grunfeld with this g captures so that we hold on to the c4 square and like give some support to that pawn? And one thing we see a lot from the black side in the Grunfeld, now that we can't really play C5 and A5 looks, uh, you know, potentially okay, but not necessarily. A move like F5 can sometimes come into play just to mm. kind of get a little bit of play for black. Actually, you're threatening to play F4. Yeah, um, good and point, Jen. If you take on F5, that uh, pawn structure looks very woeful for white, to say the least. You know who I think of whenever I see this move is Gary Kasparov. I, I think of F5 as like, because because Gary, like, of course, was a great Grunfeld player, but this just kind of move of playing an aggressive move that nobody expects, right? Like F5 always yeah. seems so anti-positional. It's, it's so Gary Kasparov. Yeah. Um, you hate to admit it, but it looks like Anna is losing Ravek. 
Uh, don't worry. It's not, uh, it's not at that stage yet. No one, no one is losing here. It is, um, simply, uh, the beginning of the game. So our current position guys is right here. So we're discussing this trade of Queens that Anna is, will possibly go for. It's certainly the big question on the board. Like once you, once the Queens are lined up with each other, uh, who's going to be making that trade first and uh the trade actually makes at least more sense from black's point of view than from white's point of view because if white would have traded guys and the reason she didn't is because it just helps black's pawn structure and then white has this pawn that's a little bit weak so white had good reasons not to make that trade i would even say that even this this seems quite possible as well like i don't really see any bad way for black to recapture the queen so um but from black's point of view taking is certainly a possibility. So here we are, we're talking about this, this position where we got to figure out how to defend this pawn. So right, so. Do you, do, should we go for something other than that, Jen? Well, you could put it on B2 instead, but then there's knight A4. See, that's the weird thing. The knight on B6 is usually pretty bad. But mm -hmm. it has this cool possibility of playing knight a4, and that actually move would just be like crushing, right? I think that would just win a pawn for nothing. Yeah. So that's one instructive thing about the knight on a b6, which is why I'm like really keen as white to play a4 at some point to just like take that one bad square away, that good square to take that one good square away from the knight on b6. So bishop b2 is no bueno. Um, bishop e3 we could try again and then after maybe bishop f3 maybe take with the bishop instead because I, I wasn't at which move do you want to do here jen maybe we could try i don't know bishop e3 i really did like bishop f3 and f5 for yeah black. i agree well I, i'm thinking black rook d1 very solid yeah, you could try rook, rook d1 one, but i'm still yeah gonna, i'm probably still gonna make you right um have to figure out how you're defending the pawn so what's the difference True, but i guess the small or do you want, should i go this way should i go this way to keep your maybe. f5 idea intact yeah that's that's possible yeah i wonder yeah so and now bishop e3 um I, does anything change with this f5 idea um i feel like it's the same i don't, I don't see any difference yeah yeah, still annoying. Still annoying. Yeah, I mean, I'm just so annoyed, Jen, that we're going to see this queen trade. I mean, I, you'll see. She, she'll do it. Um, because it's, okay, you know, it's funny, though, but Lay's playing very quickly. So this is Lay's preparation, and that's the one thing that might be, you know, throwing Anna off, you know, and making her spend more time. Because, of course, this is a very sensible move for Anna. But seeing how quickly Lay is playing, and clearly, you know, it's all prepared, she might be wondering, okay, what, what is a surprise in store? But um, let's just take a look. Let's see here, here. Maybe we can get the computer to give us some different idea, but he, but really, no, <laughs> really. I mean, I don't see anything that the computer is saying here that is like an improvement on what we were looking at, right? So bishop e3 and simply we were doing bishop takes f3, right? like that okay so here's here's how it can go like here here uh take with the bishop and then we we rejected this at first because knight c4 looked kind of nice but yeah. i i, I guess I think we queen, were right <laughs> yeah knight but it maybe it's not as nice as we thought because perhaps rook c1 something yeah, like that I, i'm still pretty and, confident the black will make a draw i don't know how, yeah. how is it not going to be a draw gen we got bishops yeah. in the color um you know that already you know makes it very likely um yeah well and then white has these damaged pawns that can always get attacked i just i just don't see the issue like like I, I if i were white i would not consider this like a huge success from the opening to get a position like that at all so unless unless you think that you're a favorite in the tie break uh, i mean i yeah i wonder if both players might just think that they're a favorite in the tie break i mean it, yes, a tiebreak, of course, is stressful, but there's a lot at stake. And if you think that you're more likely to win it, hey. Um, well, you know you know what it is, Jen, though? If both players think that they're a favorite in the tiebreak, what does that tell us? 
Well, that it's not possible for both players to be a favorite in the tie break. So, well, so somebody's what, wrong. Well, somebody's I wrong. It, I think what it is is that it tells us that it's going to be a very even tie break. I mean, that's that's probably. I mean, and that's my my um understanding anyway. I I mean, I I actually don't know why any of them would think that they're a big favorites in the tie break. Um, uh, they're both they're very close in the match, and I you know. Yes, Anna is really good in, you know, rapid and blitz, but Lei, um, you know, Lei, first of all, I think she is a younger player. Do you remember how old she is? I think she's 20. Um, I'll, I'll, I don't want to get it wrong. She's 25. Yeah. Yeah. She's, a, she's younger. So she's, you know, had less chances to compete for these world rapid and blitz uh, championships. Um, but you know, as far as I know, like all the, all the Chinese players are good in rapid and blitz. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I really can't think of anyone. Uh, I don't, well, I, maybe I can think of someone, I don't want to single anyone out, but in general, in general, the Chinese players always do well in these formats, um, because of their, uh, you know, quick ability to see, see the board, good tactics, and, um, and pretty well worked out opening repertoire. So to me, these players are actually pretty evenly matched in the, um, in the quicker time control and i i would actually think that if, uh, objectively they would they would think so too so i i don't know i don't know why either of them would really want like uh you know to to head for the tie breaks it's not like it's not like carlson right who uh really sees himself as the better rapid and bliss player compared to almost anyone in the world and so that's why he was quite comfortable going into rapid tie breaks in his world championship matches um Although I guess if he was playing Nakamura, he would have reversed that strategy. Or even with Nepomniachtchi, he was clearly trying to win in the classical portion, which he obviously yeah. did. But that, yeah, that was an epic decision that I actually talk about. I give a lot of uh, speeches to like lay audiences where, you know, some of them play chess and some of them don't. And I talk about that game that uh, Magnus Carlsen played against Fabi, that uh, 12th game of the world championship in London and how he made this shocking decision to take the event into tiebreak, even though he was better. And it really startled people. Gary Kasparov was like saying, this is insane, like yeah. we're shocking. Uh, Kramnik said he wouldn't be able to sleep for a week. Susan Polgar was shocked as well. And, yeah. you know, later it came out that he really wanted this tiebreak because he wanted to play more games, right? It's like a poker concept as well. The more games you get, if you're a stronger player in that format, the more likely you are to win, right? So he was willing to give up his advantage on the board to get more iterations. Uh, so it does one of these players believe that that's the case for them? I think they both do. And I think that that's a good thing because, you know, there have been studies, Irina, that show that if you have an accurate belief of your um, abilities in life, and like your attributes, mm -hmm. what does it say about you? If you have an if accurate, if you have an accurate uh, a yes. evaluation. Yeah, wow. accurate. So if you are ranking yourself like mm -hmm. on your like, you know, all your different uh, different attributes intellectually and personally, mm -hmm. um, like the same that maybe some, your friend would or your, your colleague. Wow. I mean, I don't know. Is it saying that you have like, I mean, to me, it sounds pretty good if you have, no. but it's not it's right. Just, no, I know where you're going with this. It's probably like a sign of like low self-esteem or something. No, it's a sign of, it's a, it's a sign of potential depression. Yeah. Right. It, that people wow. who are clinically depressed sometimes accurately rate themselves. Whereas like the average person who, um, you know, just thinks highly of themselves. It's usually a good defense mechanism because this is what allows us to be successful. And I think chess players probably have to have it even more, especially when they're in the arena. Like, you know, why would you want to have an accurate um, understanding of your abilities when you're playing for the world championship? You should think that, you know, you're, you're, you're a goddess and you're going to crush <laughs> everyone. Well, okay, and I, I agree. Think... Yeah, I agree in some sense, Jen, um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, confidence is better for sure than lack of confidence. Um, and, you know, including on the chess board. At the same time, you know, we also as chess players, um, you know, value objectivity. You want to have uh, some sort of, you know, objective perspective on your strengths, your opponent's strengths. So I don't know. Um, and, you know, we have this thing in chess, like don't never underestimate the opponent, right? That's something we learned from the beginning. 
So I don't know if it's really that bad in chess to be to have something close to an objective assessment. But I mean, OK, maybe objective, but like a little bit, you know, a little bit optimistic with that. Oh, yeah, definitely, especially at the board um, in the planning sessions and the preparation. Of course, accuracy would would be um, desired. Why don't you update the board? Because good news for queen lovers, which I'm sure is everybody in this chat. Chess Queens, thank you for the shout out, by the way, um, for, for my book. And yes, there is a chapter on Costa Nuke. Um, queen B3 and the Queens live on, Irina. We were so um, expecting that end game, but you know, actually it was looking very, very comfortable for Anna with the black pieces. Um, so, I mean, and in fact, in some of those lines, it felt like white was kind of like trying to like cobble back into equality. So yeah. this really makes a lot of sense to keep the queens in the board. Yeah, but you know what does what what is surprising is actually the sequence of moves, right? So think about it. The queen goes there, then like a couple of moves later, she goes there. I mean, that's interesting why that dance is happening, right? So she could have, she could have like it seems like the idea of this is like to get the queen there, where you're trying to say that it's worse, because I guess I mean I don't know like why wouldn't you just immediately step back? to b3 i think we were talking about that right there's like this yeah bishop b6 and d5 yeah we actually mentioned some ideas like that but after queen d6 castles okay bishop g4 so anna decides that she doesn't want to go for the end game and then lay actually just says uh okay you don't want to go for that so i'm going here um really fascinating uh sequence now one important point in this position is that the usual c5 is always running into bishop a3. And in this position, there's no knight a4. Yeah, that's true. I think that, and, and you know, also maybe she just changed her mind. You know, looked at the, uh, looked at some of those end games and really um, assessed that it wasn't much for her. Um, although she has used almost no time according to the clock that I see, so. Uh, I I, uh, I don't know what to make of the theory, but very nuanced. What about Bishop E6, right? What if we go Bishop back? Bishop E6 right here? Yeah, yeah okay. We well, note that we don't have to play D5. And this can right. be hard for people because it's like, well, you get to attack your opponent's piece for free. Why wouldn't you do it? We we can move back to like D uh, uh, B1 mm -hmm. and then play like D5 later or something. Yeah, we can wait for their knight to come but we, before we, before we win their knight like that. Very very clever, Irina. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So it. Oh, also, wait, wait a second though. Um. Okay, bishop c four. Cool. Yeah. All right. So okay. I mean, this seems fairly solid for white. White can actually look at interesting moves like a four. A four. Yeah, actually, yeah. kind of like that idea because there's bishop a three and. Well, okay. This is an interesting kind of reminds me of some Nimzos actually, where Black tries to play on these light squares. Um, perhaps that's not a bad, not a bad uh, position for Black. Yeah, it's kind of nice, right? Like either Queen C4 or Knight C4, and you try to do some blockade. So maybe we can try something else on Bishop here. What are some interesting options? Um, there's nothing like terribly terribly exciting um so i think bishop c4 is a pretty solid move just kind yeah, of what? rerouting but but you know what she doesn't have to reroute the bishop but it, it okay i see what you mean it looks compelling uh if you're if you're willing to reckon with d5 maybe we should look at d5 just because it's the most forcing yeah so queen B2. i was just saying so bishop e6 d5 let's look at this mm -hmm. again yep and then you're going to play like bishop d7 or something or go back to g4 i'm just going to go back and see okay can i go back to g4 and mm -hmm. now how do i improve my position i could play yeah, rook a3. b1 maybe even yeah rook, bishop a3 is good um bishop a3 where's the queen gonna go i guess to f6 it's awkward but not necessarily in a bad way we have yeah. e5. All right, let's, let's look at it. That's a very critical move. Ah, queen f4. Wow. So give up oh, this pawn. Yeah, play rook f8 or take on e4. So I guess we don't want to let the queen in. Okay, so we, we go rook b1. 
because we want to go C4. We want to get out of that pin. That's the idea. Yeah. So now when you go C6, I go C4. I have to say that visually, this looks very nice for white. Like if oh, I, yeah. yeah, without any sort of eval bar, I would be comfortable here as white um, in this position. I would think I got a kind of a classical Grunfeld advantage with this center pawn and this bishop that can uh, go to either of those squares. Um, okay, the computer was evaluation is that it's not like that big of a deal for black, but it's the kind of position we could see today. You've got to be a little vigilant for black. That's a thing. So yeah, maybe black can defend, but you've got to watch yourself every move. E5, bishop A3, all these things. You got to make sure that it's all good. A4 ideas with A5. Yeah. And um, meanwhile, white doesn't have to be as vigilant. There's no real yeah. The only idea. This is the only threat. Yeah, <laughs> the only yeah. one. So I guess maybe that's why we put the bishop there. And that's why computer evaluations don't always tell us everything because there isn't necessarily a um, metric for vigilance or difficulty, right? Like how difficult it is to defend a position. So a position that could be very hard to defend could be zero, zero, zero um, because the computer sees all the brilliant defensive moves. Um, so that, that, you know, that's something that probably will be developed in the future as computers really start to think more like humans or AI. Uh, by the way, we've got a lot of great comments coming in from our chat. Um, just really uh, brilliant thoughts here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, why isn't the women's candidates held at the same place as the open candidates? I mean, both of them are on very different schedules right now. Um, and I think some of the women's candidates events are also complicated um, by visa issues. So... They're, they're yeah, asking if why they're not held at the same time as the open candidates. But in a if, from a general point of view, I think it's a, actually a good idea. In fact, Emil Sotolsky posted a thread, uh, the CEO of FIDE, about why um, women's tournaments like this one don't get as much attention as they deserve. Well, apparently 4,000 of you um, have woke up bright and early here in the United States to, uh, to tune in. And that, that more because we have YouTube as well. I'm just looking at Twitch at the moment. Um, but we, uh, we got a lot of interesting comments. And one of the comments, Irina, was why not follow the example of the U.S. championship where the U.S. champion, the women's championship are held together and have the women's candidates alongside the uh, open candidates to give more attention to the ladies. Yeah, I mean, um, that's actually, I completely agreed with that idea. And I actually wrote an email to Emil with, some, with uh, my my uh, thoughts on his question. And that was my number one sort of idea that that's exactly what they should do. Um, try to hold these tournaments together um, because it just generates a lot more visibility uh, for the top women players. And I think what we found is really that it adds to both tournaments because um, it just makes the event, you know, more colorful, more decisive games, more storylines um, and Sometimes when there is like, let's say a bit too, uh, too many draws on one side, you know, the other side of the tournament is bringing those decisive games. Um, so I think once you put it in front of people, like, uh, you know, of course they, they like to watch the commentary of the, high, uh, of, of the, the commentary, the, the games of the highest rated players. Right. So that's just kind of like an automatic thing. But once you actually put it in front of them, like here are these top women players, and their event, I think people have, you know, they're very interested. I don't know how you can compare that interest, but like they definitely like watching the women's games. So I think that's just the trick, you know, hold the events together and both of them will gain from it. That's right. I was um, the, the chair of the organizing committee for the first few um, U.S. chess championships and women's championships that were held in St. Louis. And that was definitely a point that I made that some people think that the women, um, at a separate venue, the spotlight's entirely on them. And that is an argument, but yeah. I think an even stronger argument is the larger number of eyeballs that you get when you yeah. hold them together, which I think has certainly been born true as the, now people are just like addicted to the US championships and the women's together. It's just such a great yeah. event. It's honestly it my is. favorite, so. Yeah, well, Jen, great job on that, honestly, because 
um you know when the events were held separately there was a plus there was a plus for me personally because i got to play in both the open and the women's for a couple of years like in 2009 and 2010 and i really you know was happy about that as a player right like i could um i mean i i really appreciated the opportunity to play in the u.s championship it was a larger field back then back then guys like you know maybe 20 players or so and so they would have a spot for like the top female and um maybe even top two females, because I remember Anna played in one of those years as well. So that was great for us to get that kind of training. Um, you know, it was one of those championships, I was really close to a GM norm, I missed it by half a point. Um, but at the same time, you know, when they combine the events, okay, I lost the chance to play in both, but I can see how it makes sense for the tournament as a whole, um, you know, because it has really improved the, um, the visibility of the U.S. Women's Championship, and yeah, now at this point, I would and I would not want these events to be separated. Oh yeah. Um, well, I think the thing there's a really good point though there that if women start to qualify for the open event, that would be mm -hmm. a really really good reason to reassess. But yeah. you know that like if you start having like one or two women who are in the top. Uh, 20 players in the United States, I think it would be a really good rationale to be like, well, maybe we should think again about this, right? Right. But there will probably be some more advanced notice of that because you'll see, you know, the the uh, the ladies are rocketing up for the rating charts, which I sure yeah. hope to see. I sure hope to see. Um, you know, it's uh, something that we've been waiting for and we just need to get the numbers up. Right now, actually, US Chess is back on track with like, we're close we're closing in on like the, the 14, 15% rate, um, which, you know, have to have to go up from there. I have to go up from there. There are some countries that have like 20, 30%, um, but you need to widen the base to increase the chances that there will be women in the, the open competition, right? Um, yep. If you will, if you only have 10% participating, then the chances that one of those women will be in the, uh, the top uh, few players in the country or the world are, are much lower. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right, guys. Look, we have more moves on the board after Queen B three. Bishop E six uh, did happen. Yeah, that's the move that we looked at. And so now is the big choice for Lay, who finally is thinking. By the way, she's now has a half an hour edge on the clock, so her preparation with this line has definitely paid off because. Sometimes even if you don't have an advantage on the board, but you have an advantage on the clock, I mean, it's, it's already a sign that your preparation worked out. Um, half an hour is worth quite a lot. Now she has to decide between D5 and Queen C2. Those are the main options. So one of them is like more committal, pushing the pawn, but it stops Bishop C4. The other one, um, I think the main drawback of this move is just this one. It has to be the problem. And then the thing is when these pieces come off the board, even though white has a space advantage, as you guys know, space advantage becomes less valuable the more pieces are traded, right? So um, the computer might still really like white here in terms of the eval, but I would say, I would say, you know, it's not so clear, Jen, to me, you know, like where to go for an advantage for white. Do you want to try making a few moves here? So bishop e6 um, has been played, uh, but queen c2 and bishop c4 aren't on the board yet, right? Yeah, exactly. We're just discussing this position after queen c2, bishop c4. Like, what, what would you like to do for white? Um, I've got a lot of possibilities here. I could play rook d1 or rook b1, obviously makes sense with the idea of a4. I could play a4 right away. Let's try a4 right away. Yeah, so I think... So this move we think we mentioned, right? That was this idea with queen c6 trying to get into c4. Yeah. So if right. I go... oh, so, so now with a5, you have queen c4 right away. And... Yeah, we're knight c4. I guess I would think about it. Because if queen c4, I, I mean, maybe queen c4 as well. I don't know if it's knight c4 or queen c4. They both seem possible. All right, let's go knight c4. So you currently can play because d5 you just have queen c5 and that kind of holds everything together at the moment huh yeah or even queen a6 i wonder uh they're both yeah queen they're a6 impossible yeah 
Yeah. Okay. So A4, let's try again then, because I, I, I'm not a big fan of that. So maybe we should develop one of our works first and see if we can make that idea of A4 work more, um, more organically. Uh, like maybe let's just develop, how can I make it so that A4, A5 doesn't allow you to have that white square domination? It's a question yeah. For me. It's a good, it's a question because this is really, that square it's is coming no matter up. what. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming, it's kind of coming no matter what, like, if we play if rook, uh, if we play bishop, right, yeah, sure, bishop two five, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing is, Jen, I can still do it. I like I can still play queens to six if I want because I can just give you that pawn. No big deal. But also, I guess there is always the typical c five, right? We go back into regular Grunfeld ideas. Yeah, yeah. It looks so I. I see what you're saying. It looks a bit better for white than it is. Um, yeah, like it's pretty solid for black, I think, with those bishops traded. I guess, you know, what I'm feeling, Jen, oh, I think maybe we should keep these bishops uh, on the board and, you know, take the plunge and go d5. Yeah, I think you're right. If, if queen c2, you can just play for this bishop c4 stuff. Maybe just go for d5. Yeah, just logical because, yeah, it keeps things a little juicier. And you were going to go back to g4. Yeah. Um, this is what we looked at, right? And then, then we were looking at, uh, what were we looking at? We had a few moves in mind here. The problem with Bishop A3 was Queen F4 was a surprisingly strong point for the Queen. Yeah. So I think we were doing Rook B1 and C4. And we yeah. thought that that was a pretty nice position for White. Um, yeah, that was what we looked at. Yep. Um, so I agree, I agree. I think D5, um, well, it's one of those things. D5 is good if Queen C2 uh you know doesn't really hold the tension and and it doesn't because you were able to just like trade off one of your pieces and reduce your your space deficiency so yeah what's going on in this position jen um i'm trying to make some concrete moves for black trading off the light squared bishop to get that square um is can black equalize you know in this sort of simplified position or does Maybe. white still have the edge they might, but I think this is an example of one of those positions where it's like you who's doing mm -hmm. the lifting and you, you have to be more accurate. And I, I just, it, it doesn't look like white has a, ho a whole lot of risk, to be honest, like mm -hmm. rook d1 or a4. And, and we have a lot of options too, whereas you have to look at all my options. It's kind of annoying. Um, Dame Marvin said, who are the commentators? I am Jennifer Shahadi and I'm here with Grandmaster Irina Krash. We are very happy to be here. Yeah, I think we're very happy um, to be here, guys, bringing to you the final game of the women's semifinal match uh, here in Monaco between Lei Tingji and Anna Musichu. By the way, guys, I, here's a question for the chat. Where In this position, where would you move your bishop? Because this is a pretty big decision for White. Let's see how uh, uh, alert you are. So we'll do some training. All right, good stuff, guys. Good stuff. These women are getting so powerful. All these women would destroy 99% of the population. Alice Lee has the best chance to get into the open section one day. Okay. Um, it's great to see more women at the top. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of good questions, good, good comments here. Bishop E1 is a move you have to make, even though you really don't yes. want to. Yeah. Because of the square, guys, uh, you got to be careful about where you move your bishop. Your bishop's got to keep controlling it. Bishop c3 is possible, but I think in general, uh, we don't really want to trade our bishop pair off. It just, I mean, this, this bishop is not that amazing. And also then there's this issue of this pawn hanging at the end. So I guess white would have to bring the bishop there, even though it looks really weird to leave that rook trapped in the corner. And then, okay, how do we evaluate this, Jen? like this type of position because we've got two bishops but like our bishops are not the best and black actually has a pretty good amount of activity so we got to start rerouting this bishop in classical i like white mm -hmm. in classical chess i like white yeah you do like white yeah, yeah. you feel yeah. like there is potential for me yeah for my bishops to like kind of come out oh yeah, yeah you're great at this type of position little space little two bishops just don't hang anything yep <laughs> and we're rolling we're rolling with our our pods anita drink said chat has been so nice for the whole time tournament why is everyone so 
Ooga Booga today. I, I just really wanted to say Ooga Booga. <laughs> yeah. I had to read that one out loud. So, Jen, uh, Bishop E6, Lay is thinking, and we don't have a move yet. Let me just update the board. So, she, yeah, big moment for Lay, guys. This is uh, one of those things that really determines the direction of a game. And it's actually Lay's first think in this game. She's already been thinking for about nine minutes. Um, and she's thinking, should I defend my queen like that or pull it back to C2? And the issue with pulling it back to C2, as we saw, is that definitely Anna is going to go for that bishop trade. And does she want to trade pieces? I, I, I have a feeling like this move is the right one, just to keep it more complicated. I agree. By the way, we got a good question from Joker FMJ2. Um, Jan and Irina, did you ever self-impose a time limit for moves at any point in the game? Like use less time at the beginning to save time at the end. Um, that's a great question. I mean, if you are struggling with um, time pressure addiction, uh, it's a great idea to like write down your time codes on your score sheet, which you are allowed to do as far as I know. And therefore you can kind of see how much time you spend at different moments in the game and analyze it later. Also, I had a, a session once with a grandmaster coach, Gregory Kaidanov, and I remember him advising me to, to take a tournament, which wasn't that important, like not a national championship or an Olympiad, and make the entire point of the tournament be not to get into time pressure. So like, mm -hmm. even if I lost rating points, I basically won if I didn't get into time pressure. And that's like really good advice because it's like anything in life, usually becoming better is like a whole bunch of tasks and mini tasks combined into one. And if you're having a problem with one area, it might make sense to just like hyper focus on that. Yeah, I'm looking at Anna's face right now. She looks kind of stressed out, don't you think, Jen? Um, I can't always correlate people's facial expressions to how they feel inside as a poker player. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes people, sometimes people faces like almost give off the opposite of what they're really feeling. You know, yeah, like, but in I chess, know. in chess, you know, in chess, it's like, it's, I, I feel like, if, well, it's actually impossible to, um, for example, fake the kind of face that Anna has. And this is not like, you know, that, that type of face is, uh, I mean, okay. It's kind of, she's thinking, she's probably calculating, but it definitely feels like a rather, um, more tense than usual is what I would say. Is, was like I displeased think. maybe a little displeased with it maybe yeah. she's running not not trading queens with queen takes before earlier because now she's got to deal with these headaches and 20 minutes behind on the clock you know that's something that like great players like anna muzichuk usually wouldn't do um usually you're not trying to think in the past but you're trying to think in the present but still sometimes uh you know you're, you're in a tough middle game and you're like man on move 10 i could have just gone queen takes v4 and bishop g4 right I mean, I feel like Lei, like Lei was in her, is just in a normal chess player thinking pose, but like the way the camera did that close up on Anna, I was like, whoa, that, that face is like a more, more stressed than usual. Um, and by the way, guys, I uh, may be good news for us. Well, she, Lei did um, agree with us and she decided that her chances were better not allowing the bishop to come to C4 uh d5 and bishop g4 so now i do think there is a great chance we're going to see the move rook b1 because it's so uh such a natural thing to want that pawn to be able to advance to c4 to support the center so what better way to do that now there are i suppose other ideas um i suppose we could try looking at some Tac more tactical things where we try to win that pawn. I just don't think that's going to happen, Jen. Like, I think rook b1 will happen. I mean, if you go here and c6, right? Um, a5, knight d7. Like, are you really going to be grabbing that pawn with, like, you know, your development unfinished? I don't think so, I don't right? think so. Yeah. No, no not... Not without a a big uh, a big big consideration to say the least. Although she's like, got time, right? Yeah. What about I mean, this, though, Jen? Why would you do that? Like, I mean, they can still go c six. So what's the what's the point? I don't really get that one either because you can't play c four. So now you have to go for this stuff. 
Oh, uh, maybe queen c7. Why, is why not? Seven? Because you don't want to give up the pawn at this point. Queen f4, bishop e7. But there's rookie. Oh, eight. there's d6, though. Yeah. There's queen e4 right away, too. That's just complicated, right? Bishop e7. What about queen e4 right away? I know I, I know you can take that. Like yeah. Yeah. Queen probably not. Two. Probably no. Probably no need. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think that black would like be that interested in this in this line um but why not queen c7 like what's what's wrong with that oh d6 right ah oops i just walked into something pretty major yeah um in that case well i would love for you to play c5 and get the pressure off my center uh, rook d1 maybe i would say there is Oh, well, there's a chance, you know, for a move like rook d1 with the idea of it actually, the point of it is that you're stopping c6 in a way. You're really discouraging c6, basically. And the c6 is one of Black's main ideas. So you're discouraging it because of that d6 move that we're preparing down the line after bishop a3. All right, Jen? Yeah. And let's see, do we have a move? Bishop g4 on the board. Rook B1 is our what we anticipate. And yeah, I I do think Anna can go back in time and wonder about that queen takes before. But after the game, really, it's a better time to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so a chance she might go rook D1. You know, I do think there's a chance for that because it really like like none of those moves are possible. Or at least like, I mean, yeah, this move is, is you know, C6 is possible. I just don't think it's I think it's fair to say that black will be discouraged from doing that move when they see Bishop A3. I mean, to me, to believe that Anna is going to, like, want to go into some line where she, like, has to sack the exchange. Um, yeah, I don't believe that. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she will want to try to Well, let, Let's continue problem. this line just for funsies. Oh, yeah. okay. I wasn't even sure about that. Um, and then, oh, okay. I see. I see. I, I was thinking of taking on E2, but then I guess Bishop G7 would have been, like, really good. Yeah, like, okay, you're yeah. going to be having, um, you're going to be having a pawn for the exchange, like you can take that pawn. And yes, you do have compensation, bishop and pawn for the rook, but still, um, it's not the kind of position where I'd be so confident I'm making a draw as black. So I just, I wouldn't really want to get anywhere near this position if I don't have to, because I mean, it's quite obvious you're playing just for a draw. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always activity. I don't want to say, like, the bishops are pretty good. So I, I wouldn't say this is trivial for white at all to win this position. I just mean that I don't think I would want to go here because white's rooks are just not that bad. You know, normally when you sacrifice an exchange, you want to make sure that your opponent's rooks are not going to be good. But in this position, white's rooks are going to come to the open files. And now, by the way, we did she's hmm? just see some stretching, some, like, neck sex stretches there um, by Anna Muzichuk, you know, just, like, sort of do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, trying to get more comfortable at the board. Uh, we did get another question from um, I, from the chat about whether there's leveling in chess, like there is leveling in poker. That's a great question. Leveling in poker is this kind of idea that you're always trying to think about what your opponent's thinking. And because humans are really bad at randomizing, a lot of times when you're thinking about what your opponent's thinking, you're thinking they're about to do the opposite of what they just did. Like say rock paper scissors, they they just threw rock. Now they're gonna throw paper, right? Like you're that you're trying to predict, and you know because humans usually are alternating, and that's how they see randomness. You predict that they alternate, and okay, in in chess it's not as important because it's not as much about thinking about what your opponent's thinking. It's about really playing the board, but sometimes it is about thinking about what your opponent is thinking. And I actually think in this game, we saw a little bit of that, right? Because we saw this queen trade offer and uh, Lei Ting Che kept the queen trade offer on the board for another move and Annie Musichu ignored it, even though it was favorable for her to trade queens. But then she slipped the queen back and there's no more queen trade on offer and now she has a sizable advantage with white so in a way anna got a little bit tricked there i would say yeah. i don't think she saw i don't think she realized that that queen trade offer would evaporate so quickly i think she believed maybe that Lei Ting che was happy with the draw to take it into playoff and underestimated the danger there 
Yeah, she should have jumped on that queen trade, right? When uh, Lei offered it. So um, me is asking, why not knight d4 to pressure bishop and queen? So the reason uh, this move is unlikely to be played, guys, um, I think there's probably a few reasons, but like, like the very basic one is that I'm going to take. I'm going to take, and you're, you're not really pressuring my bishop or my queen because you're just going to have to go back with your knight. And so then you just traded off the bishops and you got your knight to a more passive position and there's really no pressure on black. And now black actually goes, starts attacking your center. And then you realize like that you haven't actually prepared to push your pawn to C4, you're still pinned. And so then this beautiful center just collapses into, into nothing. Um, so that's the problem, right? Like we, when, when you play chess guys, you got to anticipate your opponent's ideas based on what you see in front of you right this is kind of maybe for people starting out in chess um it's one of the harder things right to to see what the opponent wants but and, and but you you learn when you play chess that there's clues right but in order to pick up on those clues to actually see them as clues you do have to know quite a bit about chess so here's the clue in this position right the big clue is white center right this is the pride of white's position it's that strong center but obviously with that comes the realization that black is going to want to challenge that center, right? With either of these moves, of course, you know, one of them is more likely than the other, because if you move the E pawn, there's uh, trouble on the diagonal. So that's not as likely, but, you know, theoretically, if Bishop A3 was not a problem, you know, that would move would make sense as well. So basically this move is coming. And that is something that white knows cert with a certainty. Right. When you know it, um, then its position is not so random. You understand that your task is actually to prepare for this move. And if you'd like to hold on to your center, you know, that's why we're looking at moves like rook b1 or rook d1. Right. There's not random. When you're putting the rook there, you're getting out of the pin. So when they go c6, you can go c4. And the bishop is just uh, staring into a diagonal where he can't take anything. So it's very important in chess to protect your space why not bishop a3 okay uh yeah good question we mentioned that briefly yeah that there's yeah. queen f4 all right so you actually sent the queen to that square when it attacks your center pawn and then if you take here i think there's just rook f8 and you're basically you're gonna lose that center right once your bishop has to move away you lose the pawn and there goes the center so um okay yeah, queen f4 is kind of an unusual move in a way. Like it's not a configuration people are used to. So even though it's a really simple move, you move the queen and you attack a square because we don't really see queens land on f4 that often. It can be a little hard to see and accept that. It's just a good move. It's actually really good for black. Uh, we've got a comment from the chat from DJ Shrek's best friend that chess is male dominated because women don't like chess for the most part. Majority of women would rather design clothes. No! <laughs> um yeah you know it's also you know it's interesting do i think that it's, it, it's condescending to have women's tournaments i really don't i don't see the condescending part pause to reflect there are there are no uh tournaments where women cannot participate i mean these are um you know they're open tournaments um but you know unfortunately you know most men and you know most women are not going to qualify for this at this point right so if you let's say have just one candidates tournament the top players in the world like okay well you're not going to see any women there so basically you're thinking you're saying it's condescending to women but really um the practical result of the strategy to eliminate women's tournaments at this point is that you just you just won't see women play chess in the top tournaments like that so i'm not really sure how that would be better um, no not at all irena and we love women we love watching them play chess and we're going to take a quick break and we're going to be back <laughs> with more from the FIDE Women's Candidates. The only thing better than chess is more chess. So don't miss a moment of the Chess.com Global Championship or the Women's Candidates. We will be squad streaming both events, so you don't have to pick just one. Simply click this button at the bottom of our streaming panel to watch multiple events at once. Click again to switch back to a single screen. Don't miss a moment of top-level chess with squad streaming on twitch.tv slash chess.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our coverage of the 2022 B-Day Women's Candidates. I'm Jennifer Shahadi, and I'm here with Irina Krash, and we are seeing the players in beautiful Monte Carlo playing for the semifinal spot, getting them one class, one spot closer to playing Juwen June for the Women's World Championship. Right now, the score is even with three draws. Lei Ting Che is certainly pushing in this game with the white pieces, but in the event that the game is a draw, we'll have an exciting, dare I say, thrilling playoff tomorrow. Um, and it will look a little bit like this. We're gonna start with four games with a 15 minute plus 10 second increment format. And then we're gonna move on to, uh, to blitz games and finally, um, to a sudden death three minute plus two second increment game. Here we see it right there. If it's still tied at the end, three plus two, and you alternate until there's a decisive result. What do you think of this tie break format, Irina? I think the tie break format is very interesting. It's designed to give the players a chance to play the maximal number of games and probably to reduce the randomness in the result. Because, um, you know, sometimes when you play, let's say, four games, it can go immediately to an Armageddon. As you see, that's not uh, possible here. They play two more games of Blitz Chess and then uh, two more games of more Blitz Chess, and then they alternate colors until there's a decisive result. So there is no Armageddon here, which is very interesting. Um, and Armageddon, mm, it's kind of a radical idea, I think, for ending, um, for ending a match right quickly, I would say. Because the idea of Armageddon is that one player wins in case there's a draw. So if you're black and you get a draw, you win, and you start out with some some less time. It also depends, you know, it could be two minutes less, it could be one minute less. But obviously have, having draw odds in chess is a pretty big deal because that means that in order to win the match, to just eliminate somebody, you don't even have to beat them. You just got to draw them. So it is it is radical in its own way. It's kind of like, it's become quite accepted these days um, to end a lot of tournaments with ultimately an Armageddon game. Um, so in a way we're kind of accustomed to it. But yeah, when I just thought about it, I was like, why is, why is there no Armageddon here? Well, because this is a candidate's um, cycle and you really don't want to eliminate people randomly. I mean, you don't want someone to have to go home just because they didn't manage to win with the white pieces and that's it. Like suddenly they're, they're just done. So it actually has a system where you got to, you know, eventually just beat someone to win the first person to win, um, win a game wins the match. I think that's fine. I think it's a, a pretty good system designed to eliminate that randomness. And at least, you know, the person who goes through actually wins a game of chess. I actually like it as well, Irina. I mean, honestly, I just think the only negative in my eyes is that it sounds really exhausting. Mm -hmm. So it's funny, like Armageddon, you're trying, a lot of times these tie breaks, the idea is to avoid luck, right? Yeah. So clearly the, the most luck oriented is a very, very fast Armageddon game. The least luck oriented would be like a bunch of classical games. But wait a second, if I put four, like two classical games and you're literally playing all day. So you're actually oh, yeah. kind of, like this game balance is quite interesting between skill and luck. You want as much skill as you can have while keeping it entertaining, while not making the players and of course the staff and the arbiters and the commentators too exhausted, right? So you don't want it to be like a 10 hour session. Yeah. So it, because then it also benefits the younger player or the fitter player or the player who just has more, um, you know, some kind of styles create more fatigue than others. Mm -hmm. It's not even always age related. I think players who are a little bit more strategic tend to be maybe less less fatigued than ones who like to calculate everything. So it, it actually kind of has a way of benefiting a certain player. So I like this format. I If I were making a format like this, the only thing I would maybe consider is maybe just a two game match to start, but maybe make it like 25 plus 10. Mm -hmm. But just just yeah. to reduce the exhaustion level a little bit. But I agree. But this, this is gonna be really interesting. Yeah, that is the only minus is that it does seem hard on the players for, I mean, four games of rapid chess is hard, but I guess it is a 15 minute rapid chess, right? So that is still like almost half the time of what we consider a normal rapid game at 25 minutes. Um, so I guess four games of that, it is hard, um, but you know, thankfully it's over pretty quickly. I mean, the match, I, I can tell you, Jen, like when I was commentating last Sunday, 
they were able to finish those four games in um, about two and a half hours. Now, the last game was very short, admittedly, because Humphrey blundered. But still, like, um, it's not, and it's not too much, I guess, to ask the players uh, to play, you know, a couple, two and a half or three hours of chess. And then you're going straight into blitz, right? So that's going to be pretty fast as well. So, I mean, I think that the system is very decent. Yeah. Yeah, very decent. Well thought out. I like it. Okay, so Bishop D4, by the way, she did not play Rook to D or B1. Instead, she played the move H3. Yeah. Which that's... forced Bishop... Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, I think we're a little bit surprised by that move. We kind of mentioned it. Uh, I put it on the board briefly, but I still really prefer these rook moves. Um, so she goes H3. She goes after the bishop. Oh, I'm trying to remember, Jen, why did I like this a little bit less? What was the reason? Was it just that there's C6 and because, you know, we're not ready to play C4? That must have been it, right? Yeah, because your rook is on A1, so you can't play C4. Bishop A1 would be quite embarrassing. <laughs> You could play bishop a3, but again, um, well, I, I guess that's the question, right? Before bishop a3, we were um, very comfortable. Mm, in but you know, Jen, with the pawn on h3, it's totally different because now we have bishop e5 threats. Oh, yeah, that is true. So, in fact, here, oh, my God, can you imagine this ending in a draw after bishop c1 and bishop a3? <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, we already even can put Bishop E5 on the board because, well, okay, I guess it's not checkmate, but the problem is you can't really defend with G3 because of Queen F3. You can try to move your Rook and then like run with your King. So maybe Bishop E5 is not like super threatening. Uh, we can also start with that, but um, ultimately, yeah, ultimately we'll, we'll be taking that pawn back and black will be totally fine. So I don't know, Jen. I am. I was not a fan of this of this ult, ultra quick H three move because I, as I, as much as I like getting the bishop hair, I also want to make sure that I'm not um, allowing my opponent's main idea to arise. You don't want to. You want to let get those heavies into the game, right? Those rooks on a one and f one which are uh, so beautiful on the Grunfeld because white has that space advantage to kind of like. Uh, line the rooks up against uh, are still not working and that's allowing black that time to uh play this freeing move c6 yeah I yeah i that. mean i guess you can try something like that and it, you know getting ready for the opening of the file i guess that's a possibility so let's take a look at what's going on here but you see this is kind of different like i wasn't so sure i wanted a position like that because this pawn is a little exposed. The rook is going to try to come there. The knight's going to try to come there. You're not ready to push the pawn yet. Uh, bishop a3 doesn't seem to be such a big deal anymore. And I just feel like the bishops, they there's a pretty good chance that black can neutralize them. Yeah, knight c4. That c4 score is so juicy. Ah. Oh. Can we put our bishop back to e2? But then the d5, we're just like one temple off here in a lot of cases because then the rook comes to d8 and we don't have time to play c4. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like Lei might have just really messed things up a bit with this h3 move because, okay, Anna is thinking she's still down a lot on the clock. But let's see. She's still not ready to put c6 on the board. But but she will. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's hardly anything more natural than the move C6. Like I'm sure she's just, you know, she's just calculating. She's just calculating Bishop A3. Actually, if I had to guess what she was spending her time on, it must be calculating this move because that is the, the testing move. And here she actually has choices, right? She, she can go back to C7, which I don't think is, so terrible um at all but i guess maybe white can try to get c4 in you know using the fact jen that there's this this type of tactic right yeah trying to win a pawn i mean it's still like i would say even if you win a pawn and you succeed in your tactic like you still got bishops of opposite colors so like i still don't know like how strong this is for um 
four of whites i mean black will eventually try to get the bishop over here and blockade your pawns but yeah she put c6 on the board um unsurprisingly she just needed to think a little bit about that but here we got it jen man i'm so i'm so disappointed about this h3 move it just feels like so wrong you know yeah unfortunate but uh there must have been something she was worried about in those lines by the way Irina, we've got some comments coming in about the tie breaks into the mm -hmm. chat and people are suggesting all sorts of crazy things chess boxing rock paper scissors poker spelling bee but you know actually in the 1993 semifinals candidates match between Nana Ayosinlani and Susan Polgar, the the actual tiebreak was, believe it or not, a roulette wheel. Right, a roulette wheel followed by this like box that you would have either a gold pawn or a black pawn, just like a really crazy um, a final tiebreak. So um, with that. We are going to go to Chesscom live and now, and the Global Chess Championships will be on this channel in just 15 minutes, but please do stay with us with some squad streaming because you got to catch all the chess action today um, and we will see you there. So, Irina. Yeah, um, we're back. I actually... Mm -hmm. I actually slightly misspoke there. I wrote about this in Chess Queen, so I could always reference my own book. But I, I believe it, there was another event that was a roulette wheel. The Susan Polgar, Ayas and Liani was, mm -hmm. it was totally random, but I think it was like a drawing of the lots. But it was like a kind of convoluted system. So like first you picked like Polgar or Ayas and Liani. Then you pick a box and there was either a silver pin or a gold pin. It was like multiple levels of drama. <laughs> and anyway, guess what happened? Yeah, I know. Well, I know that I know that Polgar didn't win that one, right? No, she didn't. She, yeah. she lost it, and she said that she said later that it was the most disappointing moment of her chess career. Uh, guess yeah. where it was? Monaco. Where was held? Yes, you got it. Come on, yeah. I can't. I can't catch you. It was held right here in Monaco. Uh, wow. That's uh yeah, some, Monaco. Some I guess it it, 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 it does have a quite a chess history, right? Because of Yoke Van Osterum ho hosting the melody amber events for so long and those events were just um i mean they're over now but they were held for man i would say at least like at least 20 years right and um named after his daughter melody amber so we got to see the top players in the world gather in monaco to play rapid and blindfold chess um you know for all those years and you know, everyone except Gary Casper have played there. And I think Gary just didn't play there because he didn't really want to play uh, blindfolds. But during those years, we saw, I believe, you know, Kramnik was really, really good in blindfold chess. Kramnik, Morozovic um, did quite Judah well. Polgar played many, many times there as well. And we saw some great games by her and Melody Ambers and Judith did. Mm. Yeah, great, great event. Um, and Monaco is a great venue. But, you know, I have to say, I feel like if you, the worst memory of your career is something that was completely out of your control, it's actually kind yeah. of a good thing because I feel like, you know, losing right. on time in a situation where you're winning or blundering your queen and winning position, like those yeah. are like horrible memories, like just getting unlucky sure. as well. Hey, yeah. Yeah, that that's happen. true. That's true. But yeah, I mean, I definitely think it is uh, a disappointing thing to have something taken away from you without like even any input from you right just it's like a uh luck of the draw um or coin toss or something like that i can see why susan was really disappointed oh, by that i definitely yeah. agree it's just like to me i guess it just depends on your mentality because to me that would almost feel better because it's completely out of your control um so it's not yeah. your fault whereas if you lose well, think, and you yeah. make a bad move then like then you could feel, I, I, yeah, it's like how you look at it, I suppose. Right? I think, well, also, yeah, I mean, also in the moment, it'll probably feel quite bad. Maybe, you know, down the line, maybe it feels less bad because you're just like, well, that really had nothing to do with me. So, you know, um, but OK, uh, here we are, guys. Black has just played C6, challenging white center. So now white has to decide between um, well, taking the pawn really doesn't look like much. I mean, I would not, of course, if you take black has a choice of how to take back is if you take with the queen, there is 
something to be said for this position because your, your bishop is opening up in a nice way. Um, but is it really enough? And also I'm hoping to get my pawn to e6. That's the idea. Like if you move back this position, at least white is making something happen. I can, uh, I mean, maybe it's not so bad for black, but it certainly looks uh, interesting for white. So maybe, how do you stop that, Jen? Do you go queen c4, bishop b7, and maybe just rook, rook b8, rook d8, and try to recapture this pawn. Can we, can it kind of happen? Are we going to capture it back? I guess there's no bishop f4. White can't really defend it like that. So what about rookie one? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you capture rookie the pawn. One, but there's yeah. queen b3, pawn b3, and then bishop e5, right? Hmm. Like, wait, right here? Yeah, queen b3. Oh, but, but like, uh, I think rook d1 is not so dangerous in the end because I have h2. Yeah, true. And it looks like, okay, you're still holding on to everything. Yeah. Yeah, but you can go queen c7 and then you hit the bishop in the pawn. You hit the bishop in the pawn and yeah, this can only be described as a very equal position because yeah, black's pieces are totally fine here. So c6, well, pawn takes, yeah, black definitely has a choice here. I mean, queen c6 keeps their pawns intact, but there is a little bit of calculation to do here. But I think, you know, intuitively both players will feel that black should be able to equalize this one, right? It's just, they have that outpost for the knight, like their bishop is attacking the pawn and this is not really well developed. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem in, in chess guys when you rush things right when you rush with this h3 move um but lay is playing bishop a3 yeah that's the critical move that is uh definitely what probably anna was wondering about when she played c6 and now black has a big choice do they go uh queen c7 do they go queen f4 i mean i think queen f4 is, uh, well, there's actually nothing really wrong with this move, Jen, even if Black just pulls the queen back. Um, it still seems fine. Yeah, we looked at that line, actually. We talked but about queen that. F4, yeah. But queen f4 just looks like so much fun, Irina. I mean, it's so tempting to play this move. I mean, you're, it, Grunfeld players like to be active. Yeah. And being able to capitalize on these dark squares is, is very compelling. Um, I think that that would be her at least her first choice. And then if she doesn't think it works, um, she would play queen c7. Uh, you know, you, you were analyzing Anna's posture earlier. Um, have you noticed any any changes in it? Because you mentioned she did not look happy, but her position seems to have improved. And can you see that reflected in her posture? You know, I wish we could see the close up again of her. Yeah, then I can tell you because I mean, from the side, you can't really tell so much. Uh, she's obviously just sitting in a normal chest posture. Um, well, here we have it. She's got her hand on her face and she looks like, yeah, I mean. Oh, there we have the it. Yeah. But did she play queen f4? Not yet. Not yet. No, she hasn't okay. you're, oh, you're just reacting to her face. You're yeah, reacting to her that. face. Yeah. The other thing is about h3, Irina, you know, you make a lot of good points about how forcing the issue um, yeah, maybe uh, threw away a big part of White's advantage. I think yeah. the other lesson there is that a tempo is worth so much in chess. It's all about those rooks not participating quickly enough, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, no, I think she looks she looks all right now. I mean, just uh, not not as tense as she looked at that moment. I mean, she's obviously. A lot has a lot to think about right now. It is an important moment, so she's like in thought. But like what I saw on her face then was like real concern, like real stress. I don't see that right now. Um, so bishop e7, and now let's say we go here, and let's say the bishop just moves um, back somewhere. Can I just go back? Like, we're, yeah. Wait, weren't we trained d6 earlier, Irina? Because I had a question we were. about that. We were. Yeah, we but were looking at d6. Is, oh, you wanted to go rook d1, right? 
Yeah, Rook on FD1, right? Yeah, Rook FD1. Because yeah. I was thinking we could win the pawn, and now, and now we can't. So now, wow. There is Queen. A so there's Queen H2 check, but okay, I I do escape. There's no mate, right? There's right. no him and a mate. It doesn't we look like he runs here. There is an amazing move. Okay, guys, this is a. Oh, is it a computer move? Yeah, it's a computer move. That? Look at this, Jen. Can I Oh, what? I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wanted to try to find it myself. That's okay. Whoa. Um, what? Yeah, like I, I, I would have had some trouble finding this myself. Although, if you told me it was a computer move, okay, now I have to figure out what the heck is going on. Okay. Yeah. So, um, the reason is that we check. Ah, pawn takes d5, queen h2, check, king f1, and then bishop takes d6. And if bishop yeah. takes d6, there's queen h1, mate. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, show that line. That's great. Yeah. Pawn takes, so the idea is just to clear the H file, right? So something like that, and now bishop d6, and you are actually going to win this bishop back because the bishop cannot ah. take you because of checkmate, and that open file helps you trap the king. It's actually a very beautiful line. Um, white is not necessarily losing here, but they basically have to give up that bishop, and then black is totally fine, so they could play something like g3 to cover h1, um, giving up this bishop, and then they can take, and okay, black will take that pawn. Basically, definitely black is not risking anything in these positions, or they can even go here. So white needs to be a little careful. So bishop a3, queen f4. I do think that um, bishop e7, rook f e8. Is there a normal way, though, for us to to be okay here as black because if if playing this line queen f4 forces us yeah. to see knight d5 that's that's yeah. not very easy i think she might see it win. i think i think she might though john I, I think she might because because actually if you think about it like of course it's not like trivial but but you know you kind of feel like okay the idea of coming to h2 should be dangerous right like it does seem like you got a lot of initiative there so it's not an obvious idea by any means, but like, I feel like she can, she can find it with, with enough thinking. I mean, it's, she brings like a new piece into the attack. She tries to get the rook into the game. She attacks that bishop. I think she can find that one, but well, it's not easy. Problem, it, oh, definitely. It, it, the other problem is it's so many moves ahead, right? So yeah. like, you know, it's not like this position is right in front of her. Right. And at some point, if she, if she finds some other way to play which with less risk. But let's see, is this all forced or is there like a normal way for Black to defend this? Or do you really have to go for that line in order well, to... Well, so if you, the choice here is between that and that, right? Yeah. So you can start so... with that. And if you go here, is there any difference or do you still just have to go Rook FE8? It seems like you still have to go Rook FE8. Yeah, it seems like you do. And then I wonder after Rook FE8, D6, is there any move besides Knight C4 that doesn't lose? Or is it yeah. like really have to? Because because what about rook d8 here or something? Um, the problem is I can no. take it. I can take it because my e yeah it is doesn't on the open board. it doesn't yeah. open any lines to sacrifice. What about knight d7? We're trying oh, to get the knight into like c5 d7. and e4. Yeah, it's, but it's like it's okay. It's not an imminent threat, so no. You know, I'll, yeah, I, I don't know knight d7, but but this is <laughs> this is really quite nice, Jen. I do like I do like knight d5. Yeah. Oh, does it does the move order not matter because we were doing knight d5 first before yeah i think it doesn't matter i think you can do yeah. it either way knight d5 or or queen h2 yeah it's uh, a very very nice line but it is a bummer because i am a little worried that like you're worried that knight d5 that she won't play it and I, well I, I mean that's okay in a way because the game will then be very rich after queen c7 Yes, the question, you know, will she play queen f4? Now, first of all, white does not have to take this pawn. So if white wants to play it safe, she can actually go bishop c1, which she very well might do. But in that case, then you have like an improved version, right? Because you can go back to c7, and instead of your opponent's bishop being on a3, it's on c1. So black is just, um, you know, in a better version of that line and can feel... Not necessarily. Good. Yeah, I no? mean, not necessarily, because, well, maybe you want to... Try to figure out how to get the bishop on f4 somehow here. Right. I don't know. Thing, Jen, we don't have rook c1, c4 idea so, so true, quickly. True, true. Right? And if we play g3, pawn takes d5, bishop f4, there's just queen takes c3 right away. So we don't really have time to get that tempo in. Yeah, they're just threatening our, our pawns, right? So I do think, guys, like, I really, really hope she plays queen f4 because 
it's just uh it just opens up the game to become super interesting and it would it would be like it would be putting t a lay under under pressure like if lay you know counted on this whole bishop a3 move and then someone plays queen f4 against you and is like hey go ahead and take the pawn if you want uh that's a psychological blow and it's definitely should, it should come as a surprise to her because um you know if you're if you're allowed to do what you have uh stated that you want to do and your opponent is just like yeah do it um i i mean I, it does make an impact on you psychologically and then you realize oh wow like i'm coming under this attack and you give her something to think about and calculate i mean queen f4 um i mean of course she will probably go back to safety with that move but i still i still really want to see queen f4 on the board yeah um um, Bik, our, our producer, points out that queen f4, bishop c1, queen d6, bishop a3 is a perpetual. But the truth is that after queen f4, bishop c1, she might just play queen c7. And then bishop a3 is not really mm, yeah. a thing because you could take on d5 and take on c3. Yeah, like this, so, is, this yeah. is probably also quite a reasonable move, right? Like queen d6. I don't know. It seems fine. Um, it gives more options. The problem is, yeah, you're not attacking c3. So white doesn't have to go bishop a3. They might like do something else. I guess the advantage of queen c7 or queen f6, actually either of these looks fine, um, is that you are really just threatening that pawn after the trade. So they can't, you know, if they go back, you are going to be taking on d5. So what we're, we're, we're possibly going to see something like this. And then black again can decide between taking with the pawn or taking with the queen going into this line. We did look at this one and I, we were thinking like maybe something like that uh, should be enough to, to make a draw. Like, I don't know, rook, even rook AB8. I guess rook AB8 maybe allows like this, this, and this. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I don't really see white winning this. Although, you know, actually white does finally get like the bishop out onto a nice square still a little still some work to do for black here actually if white if white got an end game like this this might be like the best thing that you know she can she can expect but no it didn't happen all right jen very sad what happened let's see she played queen c7 queen. but that's okay because that's a fine move it's just not as exciting yeah as queen f4. For sure, for sure. Not as exciting, but on un completely understandable move to say the least. So yeah. and so she wants to take here now. And um now white, if white takes on c6, what are we gonna take with? I guess with the pawn, yeah, because we probably don't want to give up the e7 pawn. So we're probably heading for that position. Is white better here? Well, um, this bishop remains closed up. What do you think, John? Wait, wait, wait. Why not rook c1? You could take on c6, right? But also rook c1. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm just, I'm just kind of looking at like the various at the two options. Yeah, rook yeah, those are the two options. Fine. I just like to keep the tension here as a white player. I think that mm -hmm. it makes some sense. The c4 rook d1 stuff is very intimidating and easy to play. Yeah. Uh, although you've been you've been sticking something on c4 four but can you hear i don't think so right because knight c4 there's bishop takes e7 um and then there's knight d2 yeah well the thing is that if you let me play yeah. c4 uh i guess the game is just over so you right. really gotta do this move and now yeah, you gotta do that well now bishop e7 knight d2 um yeah knight d2 oh, is it, interesting you gotta calculate d all kinds of yeah. things yeah d6 and the game continues because knight b3 d takes e7 oh my that's fun yeah d6 looks good knight takes if knight takes v3 there's d takes c7 and you could take on c1 and you're actually up in exchange here but look at that pawn on c7 what a a dynamo it is right mm -hmm. i guess we could all right um and also what this pawn is get? hanging that's also a problem so there's some potential line here that goes like this and white is going to be up a pawn in the end. Um, but white is up a clear pawn. It actually looks pretty decent for white. 
I would even say, I would even say this position, like even this rook end game. Um, this rook end game must be. You got your rook behind the pawn, yeah. Yeah, you know, you bring out the king. I mean, this is no fun for black. Like she's gonna wanna avoid uh, positions like this at any. Let's cost. go back though, because this is a pretty long variation, as they say, long variation, wrong variation. Um, yeah. But uh, how did that? How do we get that again? We we did rook c one, yep. takes on d five, takes on d five, queen c four. And then we were looking at knight c4, of course, sorry. And then after bishop e7, knight d2 was what we were looking at. Yeah, if and I were black, were... Jen, if I were black, I mean, okay, obviously this is going to be a big thing for her to think about. But once she realizes that white has d6 and she's basically struggling in those lines, probably she will go um, for some kind of actually either queen e7 or rook f e8 which is also quite interesting. I mean, both positions, yeah, lead to opposite colored bishops. So white has an extra pawn, but it doesn't feel like the end of the world for black. Like I would not be that scared yet if I were black, because it looks like I can get a blockade, like something like this and put my bishop back here and wait, 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 wait. What was that? What was that? Bishop H2, you had King F on. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Bishop H2. I don't take the bishop. I just protect my rook. And so I and then my here. bishop is just out there on H2 for no reason. Mm -hmm. I go here and I try to go Bishop D6. So um, that actually looks really safe for black. Okay. All right. Well, this again is, is a very interesting variation. Why couldn't we interpolate knight d2, by the way? Welcome to Grandmaster Jeffrey Zhang in the chat. Thank you for joining. Let us know what you think of this position. Please yeah. Jeffrey, what, what do you think, Jeffrey? Let me ask you, Jeffrey, if you can hear us. Grunfeld. Like, Grunfeld uh, guy. He's yeah. I mean, what do you think? Would you have played queen f4? I mean, would that have been your instincts? Like, what do you, you kind of like, there was a crazy line that uh, was going like this. Okay, so something like that, like that, like oh, that. Yeah, you, missed <laughs> you missed the maybe the fun stuff, but here you go. I mean, well, yeah. Like, what's well, your also, instinct? I yeah, about this position. Well, oh, you you don't want to show on the well, kill it. Well, no, I, yeah. I want to just ask Jeffrey and see if he's. Uh, oh, yeah. All right. What do you think, Jeffrey? I mean, like in this position, if you saw this. Uh, like this d6 move and you were like okay the king can escape this way and would you still you're so intuitively mean, Irina. Feel... <laughs> you're bringing jeffrey on to this position and then asking his intuition oh my god <laughs> yeah no, i think no actually i am curious though about jeffrey's opinion about the realisticness because sometimes when you move from an engine yeah. um it's hard to unsee them so you can't mm -hmm. see how easy it is to find them, right? So yeah. how realistic would it be for Anna Muzichuk to analyze this position and find the correct move for Black here and actually go into this line? Right, but I like, guess, my, so Mike, well, before we talk about that, yeah, before we talk about the correct move, like what, what, what do you feel intuitively, Jeffrey? Like, do you feel like intuitively Black's got something here or, or you would look at this and be like, huh, I guess my attack is over? Well, he, yeah. he says it looks like a very tough position and he's thinking, mm, so obviously yeah. the, the correct, the correct move is not easy to find. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And especially because she was, she was looking for it four or five moves ago. Right. Right. So yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that I think really tells us what we need to know here. Um, that, uh, yeah, it's, it's a oh, beautiful move. Yeah. Though. You're beautiful. on the phone in the car. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's a nice move. So I guess we know that. This was not so true. No, yeah. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't show this move when he's driving, Irina. <laughs> you got to drive yeah. safe. <laughs> yeah, you feel like black has something, but you don't see it yet. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, so um, it's not, it's not such an obvious line that Anna needed to find. Um, but Queen F4 was definitely like the fun move, and unfortunately, she went. Yeah, knight D5. <clears throat> You can, uh, you can analyze that on your stream later, Jeffrey. Um, it is a cool move. And yeah, very uh, cool. Yeah, so instead she goes for queen c7. And we're not going to see all that uh, all that flashiness on the board, only in the analysis. And now we got to analyze, you know, positions of bishops of opposite color. 
By the way, Irina, it would be really interesting if AI were to develop a metric for how hard it is to see certain moves. Yeah. I'm not sure how, how you would do it, but maybe if you had a large enough sample of like grandmaster players and amateur right. players yeah. and how quickly or whether or not they saw a move. Yeah. If, if, if the AI got enough data like that, could it kind of like spit out like, yeah. you know, cr criteria for like how hard it is to find yeah. something? Yeah, I, be I bet it could. I really bet, yeah. I bet it could because really all it is is data. Yeah. Especially if you, um, especially if you uh, think that that's a worthy project for AI, you know, I think that's always the question because like DeepMind went from playing chess and Go to trying to work on cancer research, which is arguably way, not, not arguably guys, but obviously way more important than chess and poker. But one could say that some of the work, not not poker, sorry, Go and chess, but some of the work they did on chess and Go was like helpful, right? In um, increasing their understanding of AI. Uh, so would this have any kind of value outside chess? Because if the answer is yes, I think it would mm. be something that they would work on developing, you know? Oh yeah. Um, by the way, Jeffrey says, thank you for the book for showing the idea and his dad is driving. So don't worry. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Good to know. Oh, tell us more about your book, Jeffrey. Is it a Grunfeld book or is it like a book about tactics? I'd love to hear. Yeah. Um, or maybe just a future book that Jeffrey is going to write one day. Um, so Jen, I, I don't know. I feel like for the point purpose of chess commentary, it's definitely worth working that out because it would be so interesting if we were doing commentary, we're like, this is the percentage chance that she's got to find this move, right? Like, wouldn't that add something? I mean, of course we yeah. have some idea as players, but it would be kind of cool to bring those statistics up. Like, I feel like that would be so much more interesting than just being like, well, in this line of the Grunfeld, White's got, you know, a 50, 6% chance of winning. Like, that's not a very interesting statistic at all. But like, in terms of like, making actual decisions in the middle game that are complicated like how likely is it they're going to find it that would be super interesting yeah and i think some players are just better at it than others at figuring that out and it doesn't always correlate with their chess strand like i've seen like some really strong players who always think that people are just going to see the computer lines and then you see some who seem to because i think it's actually more of a poker skill to be honest like being able to, to assess whether or not somebody's likely to see some weird line mm. that's more that's more poker than chess so like some, actually Peter Fiddler, I did a couple of shows with him and he's good at poker and obviously a great chess player and very well known for his like practical skills. I feel like he was better than that and than anyone else I'd worked with. Like, you know, if some line was really weird, he'd be like, yeah, they're not going to play that. <laughs> like, and I, I, I clearly remember there was even one, one game where it was like Anand was playing and he, not only did he guess the move that Anand was going to play, but he guessed the amount of time that it was going to take Anand to play it. So he just oh, really wow. has this kind of practical assessment. Yeah. 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 That's always interesting. Like, it, it's always. I feel like. Uh -huh, yeah, go go ahead. Ahead. I was going to say, I feel like Jeffrey would be pretty good at that too, actually. Yeah. JX, that's why, that's yeah. why we wanted to get him on the show, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was pulling him in to give, to give his opinion. Yeah. Um, all right. But, you know, by the way, Lay just played a move that we did not really mention, although it makes a certain amount of sense for sure, because she's really getting ready for this capture and she wants the E7 pawn to hang. Um, so now, and what else is the idea of this move? Is there any separate idea of having the rook there? Like if we can move again? Oh, yeah. Well, she just wants to go C4. That's the other idea. She's out of the pin. Her rook is not maybe as effective on E1 as it would be on C1 for that move, but it's still good enough. And so C4 is the next move. So let's say white, a black goes ahead and takes. And now let's look at like the absolutely obvious human move, which is bishop F6, Jen. All right. We're, we have a, okay. Yeah, we have a hanging pawn. Let's just defend it. Okay, but um, let's see. Okay, I'm looking at the possibility of playing C4-like moves in some position. Yeah, because if knight takes c4, then you're in a pin, right? So yeah, to, and you're look, yeah, you have to let's take with figure the, that out. Take. So if I take with the queen, what's going the queen, on there, Jen? Like uh, the queen what's the takes point? maybe bishop. Well, I can play bishop, right bishop takes bishop takes c7 right away, so that you don't have the knight to d2 at the end of the line, right? Um, yeah. So bishop e7 right away, and also um, because we don't want to help that knight go to d6 and blockade the pawn. 
So C4, um, and if you play queen takes, we just take. All right, I yeah. can see white having an edge here because the rook is really strong and this knight, guys, is supposed to be over here, but he's not. Can't get over there that easily. I mean, he can, but he'd have to lose that pawn along the way. And actually in this position, believe it or not, like, yeah, white has an edge because of the activity of the D pawn and the rook on E7, it is definitely not a draw. So um, that's pretty interesting. Rook A1, tricky move. So pawn takes pawn take. That means Anna should be really on the lookout for C4. Huh? So what about well, this that, move? What is that? It's, <clears throat> it, it, it's really weird that like moving your rook to E1 prepares C4, right? Like that's kind mm -hmm. of amazing. But I feel like here you're really overextended, Irina. Like something feels off. Like maybe we could just play C4 here anyway. For can instance. I can I every, try Bishop D6? I don't know. I don't think so. I have C5, right? Bishop C5, Rook C1. No. Um, oh, Nine then you D7, have Queen D6. D7. They, mm -hmm. you, I, I, oh, wait, wait. Start again. What were you saying? C4. So C4, Bishop D6. C5, Bishop takes C5. And then after Rook C1, you were playing Knight D7. Knight D7, okay. yeah. And then I have maybe B6 or Rook C8. Maybe I can hold that. Hmm. But definitely looks, I mean, it definitely looks dangerous, doesn't it? Um, the C5 seems to hold for black. Like, it definitely not, like, trivial, but it looks like we're holding on. Let's see. Although Let's we're see winning I... the exchange even here, Jen. I think we may be, or do you have rook C8? Rook C8, I have bishop G4. But there's, it's in their F5? So there's D6, right, sorry. Oh, there's this D6 oh. check, yeah. That kills us. Okay, yeah. Look at this position, Jen. We actually lose the exchange for two pawns. So this is probably holdable for black, probably. Yeah, still, I mean, I have to favor white with, you know, the knight is good on the outpost, but <clears throat> it's still a pretty open game. And we know knights are not that awesome in open positions. So I would still say there's some chances for white, but yeah, probably closer to a draw than not. Still, um, that just kind of goes to show you guys uh, that Black has problems to solve. That's what I'm really um, coming to, that Lay's move that we mm, didn't really see coming, but it certainly presents some issues for Black to solve down the line. And Anna's getting down to 32 minutes. So I, I actually really like this move by Lay. Well, yeah, because it's not the move that you'd expect. And mm -hmm. yet it, it seems pretty good. So that's uh, that fits some good practical criteria because your opponent yeah. probably wasn't prepared for it. And yet it still has a lot of poison. I just think it's funny uh, because we've been trying to play C4 and Rook A1 is not on C1. And yet it also prepares C4 in many variations because of the pressure, the unexpected pressure on that E pawn. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. You know, um, I mean, I guess what I'm feeling like, why do I like this move that she played? You know, it's interesting, guys. Again, sometimes, you know, the, the computer was saying that Rook AC1 was a bit better, but this is where like the human human intervention is kind of helpful because when we looked at this line, I feel like this uh, line is a lot easier for Black to navigate, to just be like, okay, I can give up, you know, the pawn and probably going to make a pretty easy draw with the bishops of opposite color with this kind of plan. But when you play rook a1 it's like there's so many issues right you a got to understand like c4 is coming okay that takes a little bit of time then b you got to be like i should take and open up the rook anyway which is exactly why why put the rook there's so already that is a little bit anti-intuitive right you don't actually want to do that normally then you got to figure out how you're going to defend the pawn is it going to be this or that or, or I don't know, or that something totally different, like Rook F8. Right. Um, so you could get into some serious time pressure here. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, like, look guys, you know, there's lots of little tactical tricks in this position. 16 moves only in. So there's quite a lot of time before she gets that bonus 30 minutes. Yeah. Like I really, really like her choice. I just think it's such a good practical decision because, you know, the point is that black has difficult um, choices to make here. And that's really where you want to put your opponent, right? And so now 
Um, yeah, like you go bishop e5. Okay, let's say that. Now c4 is, you know, one option by white. Um, there are others. I mean, I have to say, Jen, okay, <laughs> the computer is offering this line, which um, he thinks that there's even compensation for white when you give up the rook for the bishop, which is just amazing. It might not necessarily be that strong objectively, but like just shows you the resources in white's position that white could even play a position like that and, you know, be doing um, equal to black, just giving up straight up exchange. But that's probably not going to happen. It's not like that powerful. Yeah, Seth Lithenstein said move 16. Man, she's in trouble. I didn't realize it was so early. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the times in the Grunfeld, there will be like a lot of theoretical moves that will take us further into the move count. But because this was a bit of an offbeat line, they were on their own relatively early. So yeah, it's, it is definitely a bit dangerous here for Anna, to say the least. Yeah, I think I think C4, well, yeah, this, this is going to be the critical moment if she can play this move. But, you know, she's thinking here because it really is such an anti- uh, intuitive thing to do to even make that first capture, Jen, because opening up the rook, it feels like you're playing into white's hands. So it's actually going to take her some time to, I think, to even realize that that's what she should do. And if, uh, if she allows white to play C4, though, then her position is going to get really critical. So she doesn't have and she doesn't have a whole lot of choice, guys, other than taking. She needs to ex open up the queen to control the c4 square. There she is. They are in Monte Carlo right now playing for the yeah. semifinal spots. Irina, have she's you been looking to more? Yeah, she's looking more stressed out now. Oh, I mean, and it looks I, I, you know. She has taken. She's taken she on e5. Taken. Irina, you got to start playing poker. You got these faces lined up. Right, right. It's like I, Irina's impressions. You know, here we go. Let's check in to see what Irina sees now. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. I um, She did make the right move. That's good. But she, now she has to make another decision. And Aliv, Aliv Macon was saying that Rook A1 is a cool move that she would normally play Rook F1. Yeah, exactly. Well, you see, the idea is that you need to get out of the pin. That's really the point, that you need to have that c4 move lined up and that's why rook a1 is uh is a better idea than rook f1 for this particular position and look at that yeah. she puts bishop f6 on the board like i was saying it was not it was not a simple position because even bishop e5 is i mean like my first instinct was bishop f6 right so that's actually what she goes for and now big moment for lay right um is she gonna go for c4 i mean i think it's a great chance she will because it's one of the yeah. main ideas on the board yeah because it looks pretty natural doesn't it i mean and then we were looking at queen c4 now we went over this pretty quickly uh yeah. we don't want to take on c4 because that after knight takes c4 knight d2 is our attack so instead after queen c4 white wants to take on e7 straight away mm -hmm. um, and that that leaves black in a, in a tricky situation because if she wants to trade queens, she has to do it herself. But actually, that pawn on b3 will become a wonderful restrictor of the knight on b6. So what to do here? Very well, bad position. Let's, let's defend the pawn. Let's try to save the pawn, Jen. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So now what are we going to do? Are we going to play d6 or are we going to like bring the rook in? Let's go with yeah, the obvious d6. Sure. Yeah. Okay, now the pawn is in some trouble. And you know, guys, the knight likes to be able to blockade pawns like uh, that. But unfortunately, yeah. you can't do it so easily. Well, there is an annoying thing here, though. Maybe queen takes b3 and knight c8. Just a like mm. oddity of the position. And then if your rook's stuck on d7, I could go back to b6. Oh, no, not b6. No, you, you can't. Switch, switch yeah, it up with rook yeah. c7. That's the problem. Oh, I, I would actually take your pawn, yeah. Oh, oh, you want to show real quick? Queen b3, yeah. just so they can see what we're talking yep. about. So queen yep. b3, pawn b3. I was just looking at knight c8, if I, this could save the day, but there is rook d7, mm -hmm. which seems awkward, but at the same time, <laughs> that rook is doing a lot of duty here. And if I go back, and then you switch it up and take me on b7. Well, Irina, as this game heats up, we are going to take a quick break, and we'll be back to see whether Lei Tuche 
can avoid the tiebreak altogether and pull out a win with White. Do you guys play chess? You want to talk about it? Yes, do Let's do. Oh yeah. Where do you play chess at? In our door. Okay. When I say chess, the first word that pops into your mind. Protect my queen. Hikaru. Intelligence. Strategy. Tactics. Toby Maguire. Oh my God, you saw Pawn Sacrifice? Yeah. If you're on Tinder and you're scrolling and someone has a chess player on their profile, is that swipe left or swipe right? Swipe right is good, right? Yeah. Then yeah. Instant swipe right. Okay, super into that. Right, I'm into it. Yeah. You're, you're into yeah. chess, okay. Probably whatever the swipe is, I don't, not interested. So you're, not interested. So you're not interested in chess players? I'm not interested in chess players who are on Tinder. Oh, I get that. I, in fact, that checks out. If I ask you to name one chess player in the world, can you name a chess player? Yep. No, no, I cannot. Anna Taylor Joy. Cap Blanco. Wow, name another one. Oh, Kasparov. Kasparov. If you name five other world champions in the next 15 seconds, I'm going to give you $50. Karpov, Spassky, Holgar, Carlson, and. Ooh, shoot, shoot, shoot. Anand, Anand. Holy shit, he did it. You get 50 bucks, dude. Oh, oh my God. God, we just lost $50. Whose idea was that?
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2022 FIDE Women's Candidates, where we are thrown into this exciting Grunfeld, imbalanced, Lei Tingche, trying to get an advantage here against Anna Muzuchuk to avoid a playoff and win that spot into the semifinals for the chance to ultimately play Ju Wenjen for the World Women's Championship. Um, but let's check out the position, Irina, because... When we left, we were expecting Lei Ting Che to make the principal move C4, but she had another idea in mind, Rook to E4. Mm -hmm. You had also considered this move. So yeah, somewhere in our line being... we have looked at that, right? The idea is that you want to prepare C4 and also not let the knight into C4. So it makes a lot of sense. And here Anna is thinking, and it looks like her main counter to that like a move that she really needs to play is the move knight c8 okay because now if c4 knight d6 and are you saying we don't have any good squares of that on that file i mean wow, sorry rank yeah, i'm used right. to moving on i use it used to yeah. moving in the file but you definitely can't play this move anymore because then you get hit with that and the last thing you want to do is give up your bishop. That would be like the end of your <clears throat> advantage. And if you and go if there, G4. yeah, you get like attacked. And I think if you go rook g4, you're going to get attacked by the pawn. And, so, and then rook f4 and bishop e5. And there are no more funsies we'd have to take on D, at d6 or just do this repetition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So she's not going to play. She's not going to play c4, obviously. But what move can she do here? Because... It's such a such a sensible idea to bring the knight to that square. It's like it also neutralizes the bishop on the diagonal. Um, so I think she will find it. It's just a very natural kind of rook move. c4. Okay, rook c4 here. Yeah, if queen d7. Queen d7, and then what? Like if bishop queen d7. G4? I was wondering if bishop g4 worked. Yeah, because okay, that's actually a cool line. If rook c4, queen d7, bishop g4. Note that you can't touch the pawn on d5. Because if queen takes d5, there's rook takes c8, queen takes b3, rook takes f8, check. And you are going to end up down a piece. Very sad mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Um, but so this does, does look like you're putting black under some pressure. So does the queen have a better square to move to? Like, is it should it go to b6 or a5? Uh, the problem is that there's also like a hanging pawn here, right? So. Well, here are eight. Oh, our a3 bishop is in take, but our knight is also in take. And but queen yeah. b7, there's knight b6, right? Just knight b6 attacks the rook, and now the queen is attacking. Yeah, her. that's true. You got that. You got that. Yeah, you can also even go for things like that because you're forcing me to take. And then again, you know, once we're in bishops of opposite color and white's bishop is not very good. Um, it doesn't really matter that white is up a pawn. Black is totally fine in positions like that. So there's that. And then there's also this one. You can even take the bishop and then fork. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. Yeah. That looks that looks pretty decent as well. Okay. All right. Well, so, so that queen, seems like a very good move then. Queen Their a5. move like T8 seems great. Yeah. Queen A5. Is there anything that we can do, Jen? Um, like bishop b4 yeah like other than taking on b7 i mean you're you're basically coming with this move right well rook a4 rook a4 and then you go back and then you yeah just you just go, go back. back to c7 right that doesn't seem to be that effective yeah although you know although here i mean you could try now for c4 you know and then the knight's not actually the rook's not so bad on b4 <laughs> Very funny, wow. yeah, yeah. A oh, funny here we blundered this pawn. We, we forgot about this pawn. Oopsie! It happens yeah. to us all. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess, yeah, probably white cannot hold on to everything here. I, I like how the knight is like toggling back from b six to d six, like depending on the position. It's like it's doing a lot of work here. Yeah, like this position winds up in a draw because black just wins that pawn. Did like I that knight right is stressed way? out. Yeah, maybe I should have taken <laughs> it this way. Yeah, just to get out of the way of the bishop. And then I'll win that pawn and my king is always going to go to g7. So that's pretty easy draw. Um, all right. So rookie 
Rookie four, nine C8. Mm, Rook C4. It really feels like, yeah, you're also um also threatening my pawn sometimes. So Rook C4 makes a lot of sense. And really big decision for Black. I mean, where she's moving her queen. And this is where the time difference, guys, it's uh it is coming into play, right? 54 minutes versus 18, and still a lot of decisions to be made because the problem is not that Black's position is bad, guys. The problem is that there's so many choices to be made, right? Like you got to figure out like this, 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 this. Um, yeah, this. and it requires like every single queen move is possible, right, Jen? Like every single one. Very difficult position, but I, I mean, up against the wall, I do kind of feel like Anna has a good chance of pulling it out because you know this is what great players do when they're forced to defend. Yeah. That's when they're most likely to defend. Rook and F to C8, though, was her choice. She did not make the move knight C8. Ooh, so, okay. This is okay. Now, I don't know. Because, you know, guys, it's interesting. What You're saying uh, knight C8 is disgusting. I don't feel like, like that, I have to tell you, honestly. Um, I don't think we can, you know, just because the knight is moving backwards, it's really just trying to move forwards, right? So it's actually a very typical kind of uh, maneuver in chess. But, yeah, okay. I mean... I can see why you would think it's unnatural because it does disconnect the rooks and you are retreating. So, um, you know, the reason it feels natural is because knights are the natural blockaders of past pawns. So to try to get a knight here, it um, is a very common kind of idea. I would rather do it from a C4, obviously, but since we can't use that square, uh, we go knight C8. But she goes rook F C8. Okay, now the big question here is first of all, can we go C4? And second of all, can we go Bishop G4? So what happens on C4, John? Is there well, Knight C4? Knight C4, and then there's, is there a Knight? Well, Knight D2, you have Rook C7, Knight Knight B3, Rook takes C8. Um, hmm. And apparently the only move here is B5. Yeah, I was thinking about, so B5, What's the point here? Queen B5. I think the idea is to get the queen to go to unprotected square. So you can. Ah, uh, knight A3. Yeah. Okay. Hey, but don't forget, about, don't forget about throwing in a bishop G4 early in the variation. I'm very worried about that because outsting right. that rook from C8 is going to be yeah. really problematic because we're just going to. You play rook D8, we just play C4. I mean, yeah, I agree. Everything, everything is <laughs> I beautiful. agree, Jen. This, this is a really obvious move for white is, is, is an issue, isn't it? I mean, if you move your rook somewhere and I just get to go C4, it's like, that was literally my dream. And then it's not going to be equal. Um, so what can you do? I mean, taking the pawn just means you're sacking the exchange. I mean, that doesn't look good. Well, you know, guys, rook FC8, this is the problem when you play these, you know, so-called natural moves like rook to open file. You run into that, and I don't really know what I don't even know what Anna is really planning here. To you, Jen? I mean, it looks horrible right now. Bishop, unless unless knight c4 works, can we play knight c4? Rook c4, queen c4 seems okay. Bishop c8, queen takes b3, pawn b3, rook c8. That seems right. old. Yeah. So if if knight c4, bishop c8, knight and d2, knight d2. What's, Right, but that, now, this, now, now, queen takes b7, oh, right? Yeah. So let's figure this out. So queen I mean, b7. These tactics because, are... Yeah. Let's um, you take and you're trying. Well, you're up a you're up a rook right now. Well, the cool thing is we can just play queen. Maybe we can play queen takes c8 or rook takes c8, and like we're maintaining the the fork, so we don't have to take a, a rook. Yeah. Right away. The problem is that you've also. Have you lost a pawn along the way? Yeah, you've lost this pawn. So, like, if you take, right? Yeah. All right. Now, I have some cool d6 ideas, Jen. Yeah. What if I take and I yeah. then go d6? Yeah, that looks like a problem. Because you're, you're going to get rookie a check. Yeah, so this was no yeah. bueno. I, sh I should have taken on, uh, I should have played queen takes c8 instead of rook takes c8. Uh-huh. Okay, queen c8. Okay, so now this is better, yeah, because now you don't have the tempo gaining work C8, but you're even here. I mean, even here, maybe Jen, like, right? Like, even if I play Bishop E7, like I am. Oh, I'm sorry, no, Bishop E7, I'm gonna be down a piece. 
Um, I can go, well, I can go rookie seven if I don't want to be down a piece. Um, yeah, I'm like, I don't know. This looks pretty interesting. Maybe I don't have to do it, but it's interesting because my point is that my D pawn is really strong here. And when you take, I was thinking I can go D6. At least that looks kind of fun. Let's try it. I mean, okay. Like, I, I mean, yeah, you can always give up your rook for the pawn and I'm, I'm up a pawn. I'm not sure if I'm winning that even honestly, even if you go there. Um, or yeah. So let's see if I can just do something a little more convincing for white. I don't think I tried my hardest right here. Maybe, but... rook, maybe rook before here. How's rook yeah. before here? Rook before looks pretty good, John. Yeah. I mean, knight takes and the only, yeah, I can take with the king because you don't have any, uh, you can't escape with your queen. Very dangerous, guys, for Anna Luzichuk because we're seeing problems in the lines even when she finds some some clever ideas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So right and, and now. If she doesn't, if she yeah, doesn't late, go for knight c4, just looks horrible. Lay is thinking. Yeah, she's, I mean, she's got a lot of time, so. She might be just confused by that move. She might be like, I mean, why are you letting me just play bishop g4? What's your point? Right? And so I agree that this line is kind of important, but it just doesn't seem to really work that amazingly for black after queen b7. So we basically, I mean, if I take to get what you want, like is even this, exactly what you want john because i am going to have an extra pawn right like i even rook a4 like even rook a4 let's say i do that it's still still an extra pawn for me so you're gonna like yeah take <clears throat> i take okay but maybe here i don't know of course like there are some issues like you could try to latch on to f2 there is a certain amount of activity right yeah I, I can see i mean okay i guess it doesn't quite well yeah i mean this this uh maybe doesn't quite work because white can save the pawn but yeah i, I can see how you know it doesn't look completely clear at first glance this line but that if I, i'm gonna tell you what lay's face looks like she looks confused yeah, I know, but it's funny how if you look at her face, you feel, oh, maybe she's not doing that great. But you look at the position and it's very happy. Yeah, I, no, I she, she's really lot. confused. I, I think that this is the, the, her her face is not one of worry. It is literally confusion. She's just trying to figure out what uh what this move Rick C8 is all about. You know, because well, I don't intensity. see yeah. I don't see yeah, any but... any any worry on her face. Just like just like just like bewilderment. But I do think that a lot of times players, even when they have a good position, will sometimes look stressed, and that's because it is stressful. Because now you you need to win the game. You know, like the hardest thing to do is win a one game. That's what they say. That's where I believe with that quote. But <laughs> it, it does require a lot of hard work, right, to reel the things in. Yeah. No, but it's, it's, is... it's kind of a rare moment in the game when like you're just not getting your opponent's move. Like even if their moves are not the best, usually you understand them. The problem with this move, you know, is yeah, like Bishop G4 is absolutely obvious. Like she knows that and she just put it on the board. There it she is. She doesn't Bishop understand G4. what Anna's got planned on this. And I don't know if Anna is going to go into a big think now, it's going to be very worrisome. I'd Oof. be worried if she doesn't play knight c4 because if she doesn't play knight c4, that's just too easy. Rook d8, c4, it, those pawns are steamrolling. Ah, oh. and the the bishops are every piece of whites is is really a prime position. Well, maybe prime you can rook. do something like I don't know, put the rook there, and on c4 you go knight d7. Like how bad is that, Jen? I mean, there's still a chance, like for me to go to yeah, c5. Why is why is true. this so terrible? Well, it just looks like a lot of fun for me. That's what I would say. 
Oh, it does. But go ahead. Show me how you're going to win. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I know this is not even maybe not even like a threat yet because of B7, but okay. Can I, I play queen B5? Queen B Can I play queen B5 right now? I'm just hitting your knight. Hitting my knight. All right. You yeah. do have to play. Yeah, you that to, looks ugly. You have, you have to play rook on A to D8, right? Yeah. It seems like that's the only thing to do here. You can I'm trying to see C5. If, or I'm looking at it like a, a combination of maybe D6 also. D6, because then there's pawn D6. Oh, yeah. A, yeah. Rook E8, bishop point. takes D7. Yeah. You're just winning. Yeah. Just, just deflect my rook. So, I mean, my idea to not go knight C4 didn't really work out that great. It looks like and he might have played she, a move. She played it. She played rook d8. She did play something oh, quickly. Oh, no. Yeah. But it, it was sure. rook d8, which is, is probably a better move than rook e8, but it's still not great. But c4 now just looks so dangerous. What is she going to do up against those pawns? Knight d7, not possible. Yeah. So it takes e7. Can't I'm going to feel shoot? like it's a little bit sad for Anna to lose a game in this way. But at the same time, actually, you know, I would still say that Lei, if she wins, I mean, she played a good game. She played a good game. And Anna is going to look back on this moment, you know, when right here, Jen, when Queen D6 and Castle was on the board. And I think she will really be kicking herself for not going for a very, like, a very natural continuation for Black. Instead, she allowed Lei to actually change her mind and keep the Queens on the board, which yeah she's kind of straight off her game strategy jen of getting those queens off the board and i think right now she's you know feeling the consequences of that but it's but, but it's not a win yet so still yeah. liking to have to play a good technique but you're absolutely right Irina. and i think she just let her guard down because the fact that lighting jay offered her the queen trade said chill let's do it and then changed her mind it's like you always have that chance in chess to change your mind. And uh, sometimes people forget about it. By the way, we have a couple of moves, it looks like. Um, C4 was played. And Anna Muzichuk, not wanting to get into massive time pressure, did quickly play H5. Yeah, she went into H5. Okay. Um, well, she does want to play Knight D7 at some point, although you always got to watch out for E7. So... Fine, h5. Um, the question is bishop f3 or bishop e2. I think those are our only choices. I guess bishop f3, right? There's um, is this the most natural move just so that you can always play like your rook here. Um, now, what is the issue? Is like, can we attack the pawn? Like maybe, yeah, because now we can put a rook here and actually yeah. attack this pawn. That's why I'm not so sure about your choice. Although I guess we could play, are you just trying to play rook c1 now? Yeah, possibly, because I don't see, I mean, it, it does look a bit weird. What about bishop um, g5? Bishop g5 yeah, here? With just, the idea that if rook, rook c2 and d5 is hanging or something? Mm, that does look- I do this. Like it looks party. very artificial. It looks artificial, my tactics, but I'm in big trouble. So <laughs> tactics and initiative of any kind, artificial, <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, I, no, I agree. I agree. Um, I agree, Jen. Like this uh, wasn't super convincing. So okay. I mean, I like her H5 move. It was a good try. She just tries to get that square back for her pieces. Um, okay, let's try Bishop E2 in that case. Well, that's nice because now rook c8 and we're actually not attacking anything right the, yeah the problem the, is with the, the rook here she like she still can't she can never go to d7 because that pawn is gonna hang that is the problem but your move earlier you were trying rook e8 but that had its own issues because yeah we were like d6 tactics especially if we created a battery so it's like she's very cramped you know that's the nature of the beast when you just let white's um grudefeld pawns what if I still go knight d7, Jen? Aha. So what's the idea after bishop takes c7? My idea is knight c5. I just want to do anything I can to get that bishop off yeah. the board. Yeah. I like that idea. I like that idea um, because bishop takes c5, queen c5, and even though um, I have that pawn, this is not easy. No, no, this is a great idea. I think this yeah. is a great defensive idea. I mean, even if like, okay, if, if I get to keep this pawn and just go B6, like I'm totally comfortable as black. So 
I am giving up two pawns, but you know, the thing is that this bishop is quite bad and these pawns are blockaded. So I'm actually might quite get, willing to do that. I might get one back though, right? Because of this rook b2 idea. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it's, I'm not thinking. Even about, it's not even about the pawns. I mean, no one cares about the pawns. It's just like activity is coming and uh, you know, these pawns are not going anywhere. You don't have to worry about them with the opposite colored bishop. So uh, actually this might be a glimmer of a chance for Anna um, maybe we under we we have understood her idea that h5 and when the bishop moves back she will start repositioning that knight and desperately trying to get it to c5 oh yeah anything can happen here i mean a draw well i don't think black's likely to win but a draw and a win for white are both i don't i don't know would you say equally likely here uh i'm a little concerned about anna's time i think if the time was equal i would say that a draw or a win for white are, are pretty similar in likelihood, but she does still have 18 minutes for 19 moves. So that that's, that's a rough. Yeah, no, Anna is under pressure here. No doubt her clock situation. I mean, I think she is going to have to play maybe like her finest defensive game to um, survive this because the what clock think, situation though? is really a really um, tough. So what would you pick if you had to choose one? A win for Lei Ting Chi or a draw for Anna. And let us know in the chat too. Which one do you think is more likely? Um, I think more likely is, is a win for Lei. But since I think the players know we really want to see a tie break, I think there's also a pretty <laughs> good chance of this game ending in a draw. Yeah. I I think it's I, a lot of people are saying win, definitely a win for Lei. Definitely a win for White, says Seth, Livy. Okay, everybody, G, the GM Hans, which is not the GM Hans. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that I'm going to go against the grave and uh, predict a draw for Anna. Because uh, I think that even though it's really hard to find some of these moves, mm -hmm. if she gets one of those constructions, at that point, it'll be easier. Like, she can make some quick moves. So yeah. it's like right here, it's hard, but it could be that like moves 35 through 40 are a bit easier. Yeah. Well, I mean, I definitely like this H5 move because she's she's got the right idea of trying to go to D7. And by the way, I mean, maybe even on Bishop F3, Jen, maybe it's still just the same idea of Knight D7. Maybe we don't even have to go Rook C8 because uh, it doesn't seem like, wait, 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 Knight D7 knight c5 ah and bishop you know what's funny is bishop d8 i just played rook d8 and it's like i still got you in a fork okay so, question though what if what if there's is there another move mm -hmm. no not really not really queen e3 or something no queen e3 is that work no knight e4 and i can't bishop mm -hmm. takes d8 and it's kind of similar yeah i mean it's similar like yeah. all i really want like it's like I, i'm i'm down upon and i accepted that but i just want to get that Bishop off the board, and I want to get into bishops of opposite color. Um, so it, you were saying maybe this move? Um, yeah, I guess it's, it's all the same, right? Like it's I all take the, same, the rook, right? and you take my rook, and I take your rook, and you know bishops of opposite color, and I, I just get I don't know, I just get my bishop on this diagonal. This is one of my many possible setups, but yeah, I would not be worried for black here. So it's a big moment for Lay. Uh, you know, first of all, figuring out where she wants to move this bishop. But great concept, Irene. I mean, you know, for the fans of Anna Muzichuk, I hope she finds this idea to, you know, it's really a great idea because it's like the advantage for right here is the two bishops and the pawn center. And kind of like knight d7 is giving away a pawn to take away both of those advantages, right? Because we yeah. blockade the center and we get rid of your two bishops. So we... We knock over two pins and yeah, we give you a pawn, but we took both of your biggest strengths of the position away. She'll definitely she find it, Jen, because I think she's already found it because I think that's, yeah. her move H5 is telling us that, like this is not just a random attack on the bishop. Why not sack the bishop on H5? Well, that's a good <laughs> question. Um, yeah. You have to be really confident that your attack here is going to justify that. But unfortunately you don't have the rook coming you don't but even what about queen, queen f3 yeah well, queen, queen f3 uh okay yeah you want to like quietly take my pawn bring your rook over okay 
wow. she might be thinking about this, Irina, because wait, how many pawns? Yeah. This, this is only it's only two pawns, but the problem is your knight, your queen mm. are all cut off from defense. Wow. But so, on the on the other hand, what if I go king like, g7 and then rook h8? Can I do that? Yeah, what's a mating idea? Wow. Okay. Uh, so the computer hates my idea. Cool. But um maybe you have a bishop like I, I was thinking this. Why okay, is this so, so bad? It just hates, hates my play. It just hates it. Rook g4. Okay, so that rook g4. Okay. Let's figure out what it was. Wait a second. Okay. Let's figure it out. Something to do with d6, no doubt. Or queen f or queen g4 and d6. Something like with that? Queen g4. King f8, d6, pawn takes, and queen f4. Mm, queen f4. Oh, something with c5. Bishop e Maybe. Oh, oh, yeah. No, queen g4. Yeah, I actually think this is it. I think this is it, Jen. I think there's uh, I, something like that. Or and then after pawn, after yeah, pawn takes, takes d6. I was thinking maybe queen f4 right here. Just like quiet moves? Mm-hmm. I'm very quiet. Wow. Wow. I'm a, I'm a quiet wow. kid, Jen, because uh, you oh can't play bishop e5. Oh, my God. Bishop takes h5 is a real thing. Just wow, I know. Long. I know. Oh my gosh. That. Well, thanks for bringing that idea up to us, Paolo, because we were totally oblivious uh, to it. And I honestly just, yeah, I just did not consider it because it didn't seem like it, like it's anything at first. And it's like a, it's a very slow playing attack, right? Where you just literally bring in your queen. And uh, I mean, it's a beautiful idea. And if it happens, and I think there's a chance, I mean, I think Lay, Lay probably is seeing that because yeah, it does make a lot of sense. You got the queen and the rook, and you've got the center pawns that are keeping Black's pieces out. So there's definitely a point to this sacrifice. How about knight takes d5 here, and then pawn takes d5, rook takes d5. Yeah. So you want to try. First Bail of all, knight d5, I might take that, but then you go I knight know. four, right? I know, but then I then I have a piece of the defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't make yeah. sense, Jen. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. yeah, if, I, if I take. Uh, you go there and yeah, now you're losing the thing. Yeah, yeah black yeah. is good because so, I'm up a piece and I'm defending against your attack. So right. yeah, you there, must take here and be fine. I must take okay. and must then take. you will take and and then here you know you've got some ideas because my rook is hanging on d5 like but rook takes e7, bishop takes e7 seems fine because queen d5, mm -hmm. bishop takes a3, right? Yeah, so that seems okay. Well, right now, white is down a pawn, but the black king is open. So it's an interesting position to try to evaluate. Like, it's not completely clear to me that, like, white is much better here. Because, you know, if I just play one more move for black and create that coordination, I, I don't know. It feels, like, fine. So it's interesting. Rook C1. The, yeah, the computer thinks black is a bit better. A white, a white is a bit better. Yeah, maybe because of rook C1. Because this is a bit yeah. of an awkward move, right? Kind of. Kind of awkward, but is it like how? Well, maybe it's just bishop e7. Maybe it's just queen d7, bishop takes e7, transferring one type of advantage to another. Could maybe be. Bishop e7, bishop e7, rook e7, queen e7, queen d5. And, you know, we've got equal pawns, but black's king mm. is still, is still yeah. weak. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here, there's no doubt uh, that white is... Well, white is a lot better because this pawn is hanging and with a king like that, with queens and rooks on the board, I mean, that's just not going to be fun. So maybe you're right, Jen, and rook c1, what an annoying, what an annoying move. Um, and you couldn't, you couldn't do this tactic. You actually could do this tactic immediately, right? Just, just to note it. It's just that you're doing it like with an improved version, but you actually have it. You actually have it as an idea even here. Yeah, but then I don't have my work developed. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have your work right. developed, but you're still like getting into the favor. I'm still position. a little better here. Yeah, still a little better. So um Seth Lichtenstein says if a sack back is the best defense, and that's my kind of sack. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, Let's we're see. not gonna see that because unfortunately, uh yeah, all those fireworks with Bishop H five, uh Lay just decides to go back to E2. Yeah, too bad in a way. Can't blame right? her. Like you can't this blame is her. A, this is really really a fascinating, a fascinating line. And 
knight d5 pawn takes and rooks yeah it's not even like i mean here i wouldn't be worried about white at all yeah seeing bishop e7 tactics yeah it's funny because i think good players have this heuristic that if you get two pawns um for the attack it's worth looking at right but the weird thing is like you don't immediately see that after bishop b5 bishop h5 gh5 queen f3 you're getting yeah. two pawns because you're also giving black so many tempi but the because black's pieces are so constricted the tempi it doesn't really allow her any relief but mm -hmm. it, you know it's funny these sacrifices should always be in your list of candidate moves but i can see how this one she might not even have thought about it that much irena because it doesn't look right yeah well i mean it'll be interesting to ask her you know was she thinking about this and this or was she really considering bishop h5 it would be of course interesting to go into her mind but we got bishop e2 on the board. That's the move that we were expecting. And now knight d7. Anna is still thinking about it, but that's what we had in mind for her. So Anna, will she decide on the sack of the e7 pawn positional sacrifice to get the knight to c5 and get white rid of the strong dark squared bishop? Shout out to Alexandra Samaganova who is a women's fide master and a streaker. She's in the chat. She thinks that uh, Lei is going to win. Mm. Um, Lei Ting Chia. And we also have uh, a comment from Yak Kun who says that he's been a fan of Grandmaster Crash since I was 13. So wow. how wow. old are you now, Yak Kun Hu? <laughs> just, so, just so we know how many years you've been my fan for. Um, yeah, he mentions ICC, so it's probably been a wow, while. Wow, long time. He might be my age. I don't know. Oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. 29. Yeah, so look at that. People are people are still playing on the Internet Chess Club. Very cool. That's where uh, that is we, true. we grew up playing, right, Jen? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. U.S. Chess Adult Tournaments, huh? Oh, your first U.S. Chess Adult Tournament. So he started playing as an adult. Cool. Shout out to all the adult improvers. We got we talked about them a little bit yesterday. I mentioned chess ponts. There's also a podcast by Daniel Lona where he has a lot of adult approvers come on. And yeah, I'm actually gonna progress. be on, on his podcast uh later this month, Jen. Oh, awesome. Yeah, he's got this concept actually that's really cool where half of his guests are female. Oh wow, which, I had no idea that yeah. I was uh that i was helping him keep that statistic going um yeah that's cool um he seems like a very nice guy i already had a chance to talk to him and um guys we're waiting on anna she's got less than 14 minutes for 18 moves it's a lot of moves that she's got to play um yeah um, that is that is a lot stressful situation here for anna yeah, I mean, is really like what? What is she thinking about? I thought that was the whole point of H five, and then she even had all that time to think while Lay was thinking, and she's still spending a few minutes. Like I feel like that's not not a great sign, Jen, because you know when she played H five, Lay thought about it for like at least ten minutes, right? So it, that should be time that you're gathering your plans as well, theoretically. But if she started looking at Bishop takes H five. <laughs> She might have Irina because she's such a great attacking player. I think that's the kind of move she might have just been like, oh, my God. And that could kind of explain things. Oh, wow. Because once you... Yeah, I like I like Yakun who's a professional trajectory um, and thinking about ways to help the USCF or chess.com design new code based training modalities. Um, that's great, you know, that you want to bring your skills back to chess. Love that. Or growth hack the improvement curve. Yeah. Speaking of adult and well, child improvement too. By the way, one of the things I think that hampers new adult players at the game is that they don't use kid resources. Because some of the best mm. ways to improve is kid resources. Like, you know, children's books, the diagrams are so big and the positions are so simple. And um, chess kid. I just feel like um, sometimes if adults were allowed to learn in the kind of fun, bright ways that children were, it would be yeah. helpful for them. Yeah. Um, I agree, Jen. I mean, definitely if you're an adult, an adult beginner, you really should be doing uh, the same things that a child beginner would be doing, right? And doing like basic tactics books and 
a lot of those books are designed for children, but um, can equally be used by adults. So let's see, guys. Bishop E2, she's still thinking. It's been another two minutes. Wow. I mean, really, like Anna to an ID7, what, 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 is, what are you worried about? Let's see. What could she be worried about here, Jen? Is there something we're not seeing? Is it, is it not like maybe rook, what about rookie seven? What about rookie seven? Well, the problem is I'm going to do, uh, yeah, you can try it like this. Yeah. You can do rookie seven, but I think I do the exact kind of same thing, right? Well, you actually have more options too. I guess I could consider saving my rook, moving it somewhere. I could give things back. I guess here it's a little bit different because I have, um, I have only a knight versus your bishop and not bishops of opposite color so that is a different scenario yes there is you know compensation for black like the knight is a good blockader and this bishop is not very good but it's not quite as convincing as bishops of opposite colors on the board but still i mean i don't know jen it does feel like black has like very reasonable compensation in a position like that it would be pretty hard for white to win but maybe you know with enough time you can break down black's defenses so should i try to keep my rook such tough decisions irena to, to make with uh so little time right yeah i do feel jen like maybe that i mean she still has to go for knight d7 and she she just has to oh let... no oh no oh no, no? I, I oh no, no? I, I think i see the problem is knight d7 irena what is that? Knight, what is the problem? If knight d7, there's also just queen e3, stopping your idea of knight c5, right? Oh, wow. Just like that, you don't even take the pawn. And now those bishop h5 ideas, by the way, are going to be even more brutal. Wow. Because, like, queen h6 is coming. Oh, no. Wow. Oh, yeah. Now we're, now we're like hitting you everywhere. c5, e7, maybe h5. Oh, wow. Black's got to be busted here. Wow, that is painful. Oh no. Oh no. And, that, I... and you know that's just the type of move that Lei Ting oh, is gonna play too. Because yeah, she's so she good at that. Can't... Yeah. Yeah. Now this is bad. Yeah. Well, once you see it, it's not hard to appreciate it, right? Sometimes it's like you get bogged down and like being like, oh, there's a capture I can make, right? And you just really focus. But yeah, I mean, actually stopping your opponent's ideas is always the key in chess, isn't it? Um now no more knight c5 wow i just feel i feel kind of bad i feel like like anna is gonna get crushed in this game yeah i feel bad for us because the yeah. tie breaks are, would have been so much fun but this game is also awesome it's very tense very instructive um and kind of shows you the danger i mean there's so many lessons here but one that i really want to point out for all the learners of the chat is this idea of trading queens yeah. it is such a critical moment in the game when you're offered to trade queens or when you offer to trade queens, you gotta keep looking at it. And you gotta make yeah. sure that you are happy with your decision and that you don't make it rudimentary. Yeah, I mean it's not it's not really like I guess the like okay, that was one really important moment in the game. It wasn't really the reason that things um well, I would say the following. It's the reason that her game became harder because she definitely had to spend a lot of time thinking after that. But, you know, Lei also played this move H3, which we were not a fan of. And essentially, Anna was, was doing fine here. She missed this other big chance with Queen F4, which, okay, it was definitely complicated. Um, you know, sacking that pawn, that was where we saw that crazy Knight D5 move. But it was that moment. And then finally, it was, it was this moment when she had to go Knight C8 and try to get her Knight to D6. So she had, her, uh, you know, a, a number of chances in this game. Um, you know, at some point you got to take one out of three, right, Chen? Well, yeah, I think the problem, and you just said it so succinctly, is that she had to calculate some dangerous lines in order to gain equality or close to equality. And, you know, a lot of times you'd rather not take that risk and just like, you know, move to equality without uh, having any danger. And unfortunately, when you're playing the Grunfeld, it usually doesn't work that way. At some point, you got to take that risk. And yeah, well, you know, yeah. like, the, like the, the safe decision for her was the queen trade. Like that was the fairly easy one where there was not a lot of calculation. And it, the way it usually goes, guys, is that 
and when you don't make the simple decisions, then you're going to have to make the harder decisions, right? So um, you, will, you will still have a path to equality. It's just that your job becomes harder and harder. And I would say that her second moment, it was like not even necessarily equality. Like this was a, this was a chance for her to play for more, but it was hard to see, right? Like it definitely required an intuitive feeling, like some confidence in her position. She went for the quieter move. And then after Lay's excellent move, Rook AE1, that was when she really had to start getting careful. Like their equality was no longer, like you couldn't really play for more than equality. And, um, you know, I can understand how, you know, maybe she, she didn't really appreciate this move and she tried, I'm sorry, no, she, no, the Bishop F6 was fine. Even that was fine. Even there she could have thought about Bishop E5, but like, but here, yeah, this is where things um, were, she was either going to stop things from getting worse or let it continue. And unfortunately she, she let it continue with like a not very purposeful Rook move and white is, is really getting in everything they want so far. Yeah, I, I agree with that assessment, but I, I also just think that uh, Lei Ting Chase played a um, really wonderful game. Man. Yeah, overall, yes, I agree. If, I you, mean, if your opponent is forced to play mm -hmm. Queen F4, Bishop E5, and see Knight D5 at the end of the variation just to get an equal position, I mean, you know that that means you're playing pretty well, right? Because that yeah, that's not easy to see. And then even Knight C8 to D6 was very tricky to analyze all the potential ideas that white had there and just yeah. like, bite the bullet so um lei ting chi with some of these moves like rook a e1 rook e4 you know she's just really putting a master yeah. class about creating problems for your opponent yeah i definitely think yeah well you're learning from this game it's important to take out white center yeah you see guys space advantage is a dangerous thing in chess right once you let your opponent hold on to it um things are very tough right um so d4 e5 controls yeah you mean c4 d5 yeah exactly it controls so much of black's space um and yeah you can see the restricting effect on the knight on b6 as well as on the queens and the rooks my favorite move in this game, Jen, is definitely like Rook A1 by Lei. Um, yeah. But I also, I also like, I also like Rook E4. Like that's a nice follow up, preparing C4. So basically, it was just like those two moves. Like, like I feel like in Lei's play, um, you know, other than her opening preparation, her interesting decisions were a avoid the queen trade definitely approved like please keep the queens on the board that was great i think d5 it was a choice i think she made the right one this move i didn't like so much but um but rook a1 was great rook e4 was great and her position was always of course the easier you know the easier one to play with the bishop pair in the center and then bishop d4 was great bishop e2 yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all, all of these. Bishop E2, all three very moves, good. I mean, yeah, Bishop H5 was very compelling as well. But in a way, this is just like a slow cooker. Don't let her play the forcey moves that give her a, a more simplified position, right? Yeah. So I, I love this. And now, I mean, Anna. I still feel like, you know, despite the fact that like the eval bar just absolutely loves white, like, I mean, there's no direct blow, right? Which is, I guess, is the good news. Although, I guess, Jen, at some point, like, yeah, you always have to watch out for this idea. I think the queen will probably want to come back here. There's so much pressure on e7. It's so annoying. Um, you might even yeah, just want to go rook d1 and c5. Like, even that, Jen. Well, queen e3 just attacking the pawn looks pretty brutal. Like, rook d7 or rook e8. I mean, yeah. what are you going to do? I guess you yeah. could play Rook D7. That's, sure. that's, that's what you're going to do. I don't even know what's better. I don't know. Like Rook D1 and C5 and just roll roll in the center. Yeah. Um, and what are we were saying? We're always saying, oh, well, the thing is like, maybe if Rook D1, Knight C7, because now at least we can go to C5, you see? So we at least have that. We can kind of come back to the same ideas, right? Because at least the difference is that now the knight actually is capable of getting there. And if it gets there, black is back in the game, black is fine. So 
maybe, yeah, I, I still feel like, okay, we're, we're pessimistic about Anna's position, but you just never know. Um, you know, if Lay doesn't find the most precise way to play, I think it's still a uh, savable, like it has not gotten uh, to the point where you cannot, um, where you can't save it. Yeah. I mean, it's going to require still some accurate moves by Lei Ting Che. So she's, she's got to keep up the pressure over here. I think Queen E3 looks like a really logical move just because it attacks a pawn on E7 and puts the pressure back on, on Anna. I mean, the queen looks really nice on E3, maybe can go for the attack. But after that, yeah, after like, like eight, that. what's the deal? Mm -hmm. I mean, at least for this move. Um, so we there's can't D6, go right? for this anymore, right? And we can't in rookie eight. There's D six, right? So you can't do that. Yeah, we can't do that one. Yeah, this this looks pretty crushing. I don't know. To my untrained eye, it looks <laughs> pretty crushing. But I mean, maybe wow. you just go knight D seven, Jed, and you give him that pawn. And no queen. Like, I take the queen. I take the oh, queen. Oh gosh. Oh yeah. Pawn takes D seven. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's take Irina, let's take a very quick break as we wait to see how Lei Ting Che wants to try and see if she can win this match right now. We'll be right back. Chess Kid is fun. Chess is great for the brain, but it's also fun to play. And Chess Kid makes it easy to have fun. Whether your child is a total beginner or a prodigy, they can hop on and find a well-matched opponent from around the world at any time. Chess Kid is the safe, parent-approved way for your child to play chess online. Chess Kid is educational. To kids, it feels just like playing, but chess is a great way to learn patience, strategy, and critical thinking. Chess Kid features a comprehensive training program that guides kids to level up on their way to mastery. There are more than 50,000 chess puzzles and a whole library of entertaining videos that teach strategies, tactics, openings, and end games specifically for kids. Chess Kid is easy. Whether you're a parent helping your child, a coach managing dozens of kids, or a school of hundreds. Signing up is free and easy, so what are you waiting for?
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2022 FIDE Women's Candidates. I'm Jennifer Shahadi. I'm here with Irina Krush. And this game between Lei Ting Che and Anna Muzuchuk has just blown up. Irina, when we left, it was mm -hmm. Rook AC8. Um, who if Rook E1 was played? So we oh, were looking yeah. at Queen E3. Kind of similar idea, mm -hmm. like amping up the pressure on E7. Rook D7 was played. And now this beautiful idea, by the way. Now that the yeah, Rook D7. rooks are on that uh -huh. diagonal. Yeah, I guess, G4. you know, Rook D7 totally took away the ideas of Knight D7 of repositioning this Knight. So it's a little bit sad. I don't know. Was there, I mean, was there still this idea, Jen? Could we actually have gone here? Because that was Maybe something... that would have. Yeah. yeah. That would have been better, Irina. That would have been better, but. Here's the idea, though, after Rook D7, I love this idea of G4. Because after G4, you you take, there's Bishop takes G4. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't take, G takes H5. So very alert there, noting the uh, the diagonal is now all white. Um, so H4 has been played. But now, uh, actually, our, our producer pointed out that white here might be able to just go straight with it and play G5. Because the wow. tactics um, proliferate here, Irina. Tactics yeah. abound. G5, bishop takes G5, bishop G4, yeah. F5, D6. Whoa. D6. Oh, yeah, then, then C5. Then C5 check. And it's like it's like a game. Everything's coming with tempo. Wow. What's going on here? F5. It is okay. kind of tricky. Um, that's kind of like maybe the bad news for white is that they actually have to do a real calculation here to win. Ah. It's not going to be so easy. All right, so F5, your idea is throw away all these pawns to get the check to the king, yeah? Well, and... also C5 to, to win a piece with tempo, right? With C5 Yeah, well, who knows? Check. Like, you're, you're in this fork, but also, like, if I take, I mean, there's also rookie eight. Ah, scary stuff. All right, Jen. Um, I guess I can't really take with my rook. But you're yeah. right. So you're okay. right at the, at the end of the day, pawn takes d6, c5 check, king move somewhere, h7, say. Yeah, c takes c takes b6, and now, well, no, b, I'll take your knight. And now, um, you're right at the end of the line. If you play pawn takes b6, the fork remains on e4 and g4. So, what's the deal here? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. that's the thing, it looks totally crazy, but okay. Um, <laughs> Let's try to but I'm, but I'm not going to be down any material, right? So I, yeah. Well, let's see what happened because it seems like a move has been played, and it was not G5. Instead, it was the yeah. more sedate, but also very, very powerful mm -hmm. sedate, and that it doesn't sacrifice all your pawns. But like, whoa, yeah. what's better than sacrificing all your pawns to win? Yeah, this not sacrificing like, all this, your pawns and winning. Yeah, right? this looks like, a lot better, Jen, because. Um, <laughs> Just a lot more mm, natural because you basically yeah. want to play G5 without any sort of issues. And I really feel like this knight is such a sad piece on B6, right? Like if it could have, if we could get him to C5, we would have a pretty normal game. I guess we do have knight A4 ideas potentially, but we also have a lot to worry about <clears throat> right now with G5. Yeah, that's right. G5 now is a brutal threat. And so what do you do? I mean, you can't. I think G5 by black, right? I oh, mean, but probably that, but something now, like that. Now RIP to your light squares. I mean, look at that. those light squares for the white bishop on E2. Yeah. Um, they are going to reign supreme. I mean, I just need to reconfigure myself and get my bishop on D3 and my queen on E4. And you are yeah. going to be toast. Go for it, Jen. Go for it. <laughs> you might, your rook is a little bit in the way. Okay. All right. How do I do that? Okay. Bishop d3. All right. Now I'm going to be playing the beautiful knight a4, I think. I think I'll be doing that unless this pawn is already. Oh, ending. okay. So you're trying, to, you're trying to go knight a4 to go knight c5. Yeah. It's only attacked by like a hundred of your pieces, isn't it? Yeah, only a hundred and yeah, something like that, just, more or less. I mean, how am I, I supposed to, like, how am I supposed to save the pawn? It's not even that I'm not, not as worried about this idea of you mating me. I'm, I'm just afraid, like, I have no way to defend this pawn because um, if I go there, you just, just take it. Um, am I supposed to just like, tra maybe I need to trade everything, Jen, trade everything and then go like knight C5 in the end and something like that. 
maybe yeah i mean it's not great it's not a no. great position for black no but at least you're not getting mated by the queen and i have to make a queen and then check me yeah yeah <laughs> moral victory a moral victory small, in it small consolation because i mean it's like not only i have an extra pawn but these pieces are actually really good so this is not great but she does go g5 so we might we might be seeing that jen queen e3 g5 on the board and now bishop d3 is just a natural move coming up so how does she deal with that there's also is there also d6 and then if pawn takes d6 rookie eight check how does that do uh you know at least i have king g7 there right so probably yeah. don't don't die from that but bishop d3 and just pile up on this um seems really problematic i mean i wonder what i could do better the problem is I have nowhere to move this knight except to a4. I also like to move like queen f3 with the idea of d6 and then queen f5. You know, posting my queen to f5 or playing d6 because your bishop on, on f6 mm. is... You know what I like, Jen? I like the idea that when you play d6, I'm just going to sack my rook for it and then just get a pawn for for the exchange and I get to keep my nice dark squared bishop. So that might be like a, like a dream ah. for black compared to what they have. True, true. And then I won't even take it. I'll just play C5. Ah, uh, well, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, losing the piece, that could be, that could be an issue, Jen. So, um, yeah, a lot of idea. issues. I a lot of idea. issues here for Annie Mizuchik who faces elimination if she loses this game as her pieces um, yeah. are struggling to coordinate, but even more, the, the piece that's really under heat here is, is Mr. King. I mean, the big guy has only one defender, only one defender, the bishop on f6. Why does it have so few defenders? Because black has never staked a claim in the center, mm. not a big enough claim in the center, so the majors are having a struggle to get back into the defense, right? Yeah, we actually could... have a Petrosian-like sacrifice idea um, mentioned by where? one of our viewers. I'm trying to see where it is. But the point is, guys, like the Petrosian-like move like that, Jen. Isn't that yeah. kind of cool? Mm -hmm. It's cool, but I mean, isn't it true that I can play C5 instead of taking your, your exchange? Well, there's, and then if knight takes there's D knight D5, yeah, C5. Maybe, but pawn takes D6, attacks your queen. Yeah, it probably works out for white, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm winning too many of your guys. Yeah, that's the yeah. problem. Like, you know, I really love the idea of rook D6. Um, whoever mentioned that, it was really a nice uh, Petrosian-like uh, throwback, but the problem is that unfortunately they don't even have to take us like if they took us well i feel like here we actually have a real hope like we can go knight d7 and knight c5 and we play for compensation on the dark squares so it definitely makes a lot of sense but the problem is like c5 and i don't know it looks like we're losing um we're losing a piece um Rook takes, pawn takes. I don't know. What's this, Jen? Hmm. Um, good question. Well, probably losing, but uh, the bishop can just move, right? Yeah. You can just go somewhere. So many exciting ideas here. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Did it, was it, has a move been played yet? No. But yeah, bishop d3. She just played the, the simple move, bishop d3, by the way, in the original position. Just, uh, why not get that bishop onto the beautiful squares that g5 left hanging yes you can hang a square yeah it is true uh, we don't believe she had a lot of choices here she's defending the best she can g5 is a really smart move to avoid immediate catastrophe but unfortunately it's looking quite awful yeah i mean you're just running out of options for how to guard that pawn you really are. And it kind of just shows you guys that when, how many problems you can have in a game of chess when you have a misplaced piece. I mean, because if you wonder why is black doing so badly, it really just comes down to that knight. If you could move the knight, even like to C5 or to D6, right? Or G6. Yeah, even G6, I know, F4, right? I mean, black's position is actually playable. So because the knight is not able to do what it's what it needs to do, you know, black is suffering here because, okay, white, of course, has a strong sensor. White has 
a lots of pluses as well, like the pressure on the e file, the two bishops. But you know, black would be able to fight against all of that if only their knight were better. Somebody asked about playing um, knight takes d5 to pick up uh, the two pawns. Um, yeah, it's not going to be enough here because we're also going to lose e7 at some point. Yeah, that's, that's really even, the problem. Even right away. Yeah, sometimes we do that, guys. When a piece is bad enough, you can just sack it to at least take away your opponent's strengths. But in this position, it's like, well, white still has other strengths, you know, like uh, like all of all of the rest of them remaining on the board and whites up a piece. So, man, poor Anna. I really feeling bad for her just having to look at this position now. It's also hard because, you know, she and her sister both came in to this event hoping that like, you know, perhaps one of them uh, would, would qualify there to the semifinals. And it looks like they're both facing elimination here. Yeah. As Lei, Lei, Ti, well, Lei Ting Che will advance if, if this game goes as we expected. She's played Knight A4, which I think was one of your tries, again, to highlight that C5 square. Yeah, it's, a, it's uh, but, been a long time coming, uh, the Knight getting there. But Oh, yeah. You were trying this with the idea of just sacking on, on E7, allowing me to take on E7 and playing that end game. But even that was, was quite woeful. It was a pretty easy win for us after sticking our bishop on f5 at the end of the day yeah so oh too, too you know too little too late you know you had she had to try harder to get that knight you know improved but okay she never it looks like she never really did have the knight d7 idea because of that queen e3 move so but rook d7 Ooh, but we're hearing yeah. mm -hmm. we're hearing in a very exciting move here irena bishop e7 seems to win in like a very rudimentary kind of like prosaic way right but for the style points let's go rook to e7 oh jen um yeah rook, rook to e6 wow also, our producer is pointing out, oh, maybe that, that was earlier. That's right. It was probably earlier. Queen, so, if <laughs> queen was... takes, so if pawn takes e6, let's look. Queen e4, right? So we're, yeah. so we're just, we have such control over the position that um, we can really allow this. Okay, let's see how that works, though. So pawn well, e6. This is a really famous idea, by the way, guys. Like, I know I've seen games like with this exact same move and, and very similar structure, a classical game. So actually it makes a lot of sense and you're just opening up the way for the queen to come in and if the pawn takes uh, i think we just win on the light squares don't we jen like we probably yeah. for the queen and on king f8 bishop g6 bishop or even g6, bishop yeah. h7 actually <laughs> oh maybe yeah the problem is those pieces again it's that e7 pawn which is stopping like if you could move that e pawn out of the way and bring your majors over to the defense that would help so instead, uh, what about King G7 right away? Let's look at that. So yeah, now King G7 right away. And we threaten to just made on the light squares. Wow. Wow. And now say E5. Ah, oh, E5. Mm -hmm. mm, checkmate in one. Oh, oops, I forgot about the bishop. I know, bishop. right? Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Can't escape. I didn't even need I didn't need that vision for most of my attacks. Oops, sorry guys. Okay. Uh yeah. go back. No, I was just testing everything. Yeah, I know. I, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, right. Okay. Um so yeah, this looks I mean, there's just no all right. Oh. Try this one. Okay, J8. But then we win like oh, that. the bishop yeah, again. Queen F6. Yeah. The bishop nice is... one. Is helping us out, guys, by pinning the pawn. But oh, you know, she doesn't beautiful. she doesn't go for that. And by the way, I'm not surprised at all no. that she goes for bishop e7 because it's actually, you know, she had this game against Maria Muzichuk, the one that she won, and she was like totally winning there. Like she really should have been mating her opponent's king in a way that was, by the way, much simpler than this move. Like this move you actually gotta think of. Like we didn't think yeah. of it because you know putting a rook under attack when you have like a simple winning capture is not the most obvious thing. Um, but she had like a real attack on the black king where it was clear that that was the way to win. And she didn't do it. And she actually went for something technical that she wound up winning anyway, but it was, um, you know, pretty striking. So he, it's kind of like, if we take that as a pattern, as like, you know, a sort of a clue for us, 
then I think that it makes a lot of sense that she's going for Bishop E7 and like a much more safe, uh, safe line like this. Actually, I mean, we had a long discussion about that with uh, Danya as I was doing the commentary with that w on that game with Danya Naroditsky. And, mm. and he pointed it out as something, you know, that if she does qualify for that world championship match, maybe something to work on, like since, you know, the technique and making sure that uh, yeah. while most amateur players have the opposite issue, that they force things too much, maybe there's a small tendency in her game to not force things enough when she's winning. Yeah. Of course, we'd have to look at it a much larger sample size in great detail, but it did seem like uh, very, very striking in that game in particular. Yeah, now, I mean, I definitely- well, This is um, very different. Be this yeah. is very different because this this is so winning and rookie six is a beautiful style point right. move, but it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, not, exactly. Not I, I definitely don't think this is um, like, this would go in one of the examples as like, oh, I, I should convert my positions better with like moves like rookie six. I do think- I mean, it's, it is very nice. I don't know how many players, like even top players, like super GMs would, would bother with this. Right. Because that's the kind of the question, like, uh, when you have a simple way to play that doesn't really require any calculation, we're taught that you usually just go for that. Right. And unless you think that you can make your life a lot easier, but, um, I don't think this, yeah, I don't think her mistake here was very egregious like it was no, not more so in that game that you uh commentated on with with danya so uh let's take a look here jen i mean the pawn is under attack so i guess knight c5 is coming yeah knight c5 we were looking at this and the problem is that bishop f5 is such a lovely square for the bishop because not only does it shut your rook out of c8 it also ushers the pawn forward to this beautiful d7 square and it's hard to kind of keep that knight on c5 because rook c7 will win either the knight or the pawn on a7 so the dominoes are falling a little mm. bit here yeah that's a big problem right jen that like actually rook c7 is coming so fast because i was thinking like if rook c7 weren't winning i still think white would have to do kind of a lot of work here but this move, if you're picking up the a7 pawn, mm, two pawn advantage, very reminiscent of her game against Anna's sister. That was also a two pawn advantage. Two pawns is a lot. It is a lot to deal with um, when white doesn't really have any weaknesses and eventually can go there. And um, yeah, I mean, they can improve their king. So it is going to take a while, I think, for for Lay to win, but it does seem like that result is what we're headed for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this has uh, been a really wonderful performance by Lei Ting Shea. Um, let's see if she can finish it off with some grand technique as Anna Muzichuk. Very, very strong performance mm. earlier in this event to come back yeah. against Humpy. But unfortunately, it does look like in Monaco, her luck has run out. Yeah, and Her by skills. the way, it's a uh, it's a means that Lay is going to be guaranteed fifty thousand euros because she is going to set herself up for a match against the winner of the other group, and the prize differential there is only you know sixty thousand versus fifty thousand. So no matter how she does there, she's going to be getting fifty thousand euros um, while. Anna would be getting 30,000. So I do feel like it's it's a bit disappointing uh, for us, you know, to end this final game of the match that was really close on a loss for Anna. And like when we're so close, deprive us of the tie breaks. Yeah, that is true. It is fun to watch those tie breaks. Oh, but look at this move. King F8 instead of what we had expected. So what's going on? She's allowing Bishop takes C8, but can't we take another pawn for the road? Like rook takes b7 or rook takes f7. Mm, yeah, she's she's trying to get or, the rook off the board, which makes sense. But yeah, okay. I mean, you're right. Yeah, you can you can definitely get another pawn for the road. Which one is better, Jen? I suppose. I mean, it's this one, but um, still, you know, the pawns are blockaded on these light squares, right? So it's not like so trivial to win maybe i mean maybe black can set up some sort of blockade on these dark squares maybe white needs to be careful about that 
And the other way to do it is this way. That way you have pawns on both sides of the board. But again, um, how easy is it <clears throat> to win? To win this position? I mean, this mm. king is coming here. I mean, I can see some hope for black, right? I mean, not a, not a lot, but I can see some. Well, my concern is if I get my king to f5 um, myself, uh, then yeah. I'm going to be busted. Right. Well, I can't let your king get there. Yeah, I'm going to have to try to keep you out. Do my yeah, best. But I, but I can always play d6 to stop you, right? So wait, let's take a look. So uh, king g2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now king f6. And, Did uh, I go the I wrong thinking, way? D, d6. Was Wait, I supposed what, what's to happening? do it differently? Actually, I had 94, Jen. Look at that. That's oh. tricky. With, oh, with the idea of 96. Yeah, that's a bit annoying. Sure. Mm, yeah. With the idea hmm. also that you can't go king f3 because of knight d2. Right, right. Okay, so there's a I mean, little bit. Maybe you bit can. You can. Of course, you can always like just be like, hey, I give up the pawn and maybe, maybe it's all good, but this is how maybe black can actually draw this game. So, well, Lei has uh, has to make a big decision here. Like, and if she doesn't like that, she can move her rook back. But it's it is a concession. It is or, or she can play d six, I guess. Maybe d six, Jen. Is that a move worth looking at or not? Yeah, I think so. That is a move worth looking at. But and that's then rook d eight, of course. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but this but this yeah, actually exactly. doesn't look so There's... bad for black. Why? Wait, what do you do here? I well, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, like B six, and I mean, sure, like I'll be down a pawn, but like compared to, uh, like... wait, can I play D seven? I play D seven now. Oh, you save your pawn. That's annoying. Yeah, and yeah. then uh, King E seven, Rook A seven. You have you have to give up all your stuff, and I'm just winning that pawn in game, right? Right. I, I, let's just I, double check that. Let's double check. Um, <laughs> I, I can get one tempo for free, of course. Here, like because you're you're all tied up. But yeah, and then we just trade down into everything, and yeah, White's king makes it in time to protect that. Yeah, one. actually, that I think that one extra tempo was kind of important. Yeah, to just take the three king g two before simplifying. Yeah. yeah. Anyway man okay all right i mean i guess that I guess... might be that might be the best technical answer though because if you can keep rooks on the board here especially when your rook is on e7 it just makes a little more sense Doesn't yeah i also easy? feel jen like yeah but still king f8 is a good move because i feel like it's you know these choices are very tempting to be two pawns up and to say no to that is actually not so easy so I'm not so sure, like, I'm not so sure Lei will play d6. I mean, I guess, I guess the move is quite natural, right? But there's also other things that we haven't even looked at, Jen, like, like that. I don't know if that's any good because there's still rook c7, but it's a, it's a, it's a. Oh, rook c7, nice, up. nice. Mm. What's going on here? Do I have some move that? Is not completely losing. Can't really move my rook. Um, am I supposed to like move my king over? Give up that pawn. Take on d6. I guess that that's what I what I need to do. We also got a, a technical suggestion here. Um, rook takes f7, king f7, bishop c8, b6 f4. Okay. Yeah, that's so interesting. Kind of... Going immediately for um, the activation of the king. So that is an interesting idea. And the past pawns on both sides yeah. of the board. And then yeah, that G like pawn. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. Yeah, but maybe. And then you also have D6, right? Yeah, it's definitely, definitely problematic. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know how Black is saving himself here. Because if I go there, you go D6. And if I go and there, you go, you go G5. King E5, G5. Yeah. Oh, the instructiveness of having passed pawns on both sides. 
It's so palpable. You but go that way, some... I go that way. You go this way, I go that way. There's oh, some move wow. here, though, that is not completely losing for Black. And I just, uh, I don't know what it is. Let's Maybe try to uh, knight d3 check and then knight e5. Yeah, but the problem is that I just kind of go after these pawns. Hmm. So okay. there's some oh, move knight here, e4. Though. Knight e4, Jack. Oh, you want to get yeah. that one. Yes. Yeah, exactly. One. Yes, yes. That I yeah. agree with. Yeah, that makes me feel a little bit better seeing Black get this pawn. Although, although again, it's not that good. What, was our last move a mistake? Oh, wow, Jen. It's this. Wow. Look at that. Beautiful study-like move. What? Not oh, letting the king God. in, because if you go there, I guess we just kind of go and we push. Oh, wow. beautiful. Wow. But that, that, that is very that, intricate, isn't it? That's a beautiful line. That's a beautiful line, though. I love that. Because, yeah. because you, your pawn on h4 and your knight on g5 are so powerfully um, positioned that you don't, tempo doesn't help, yeah. right? Yeah. And then and then you, you can't go to d7 because king e7. Oh, this is fantastic. Great line. Great line. I Great mean, line uh, for Anna Muzichuk fans. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's why happen. this Sorry, is such guys. an important moment, you know, Jen, because it's it actually is like you got to choose between very different continuations. And it is a tempting thing in chess to just be up two pawns in an end game. But, you know, because the bishop has all these pawns in the same color, right? The bishop is actually not the best, right? So um, while I'm not saying this is like an easy draw for Anna at all, at least we can see some glimmers, right, of defensive opportunities for her. I do think it's it is tricky to find, but it's you know on the other hand, yeah, like thinking in the game, she can definitely notice that square, and um, and you know, guys, just using the fact that this bishop is not the best and really can't touch those pawns on the queen side or this one, maybe black can hold on, right? So. I really wonder what Lay is going to do here. I feel like this is a very important decision for her, Jen. And she doesn't have that much time for it, Irina. Eight minutes on the clock for Lei Tingche and two and a half for Anna. So nine moves left to make until they reach that move 40, which will give them an extra half hour on the clock. Um, very instructive moment, though, that you just don't like those variations popping up. Um, and yes, it has so much to do with the fact that that squares of the pawns are on the same square as the light squared bishop, which somebody points out. In a bishop first knight endgame, all, if all the pawns are in the same square as the bishop, the defending side has chances to draw by a blockade or fortress, or in this case, um, creating counterplay by attacking a pawn that was indefensible because it was blocked in by its own pawns. The defense yeah, I mean, was it's not its that this pawns. is a bad line. Uh, Don't cry wolf as asking about this one. I mean, it's one of those typical ones where, yes, white is up two pawns, right? But the question is, how do you get them moving? If I try to do a dark square blockade, like, are, like you know, is white sure that they're getting past here? I actually, like, visually looking at this position, I would not feel that comfortable as white, Jen. Unless, I don't yeah. know, maybe we can try this move because it it actually does keep out the king. So maybe this move is um, is an important one. It sort of ke keeps out the king, right? Because we can, of course, get the king out, but the pawn is really far advanced. Now, it is kind of hard to believe that white wouldn't be, you know, that white wouldn't be winning this one. Yeah. It does seem that way, but I, I can see the instinct to keep the the rooks on the board. And by the way, Joker FMJ two says, did I miss a discussion of what happens if Lei Ting Che goes D six? Um, yeah, you did. We we think that maybe from a practical point of view, that is the best option. Keep mm -hmm. those rooks on the board mm -hmm. as D six looks quite strong, even if these positions end up being winning for white. Um, we're seeing some kind of trickability for the black side. Yeah. Yeah, it is tricky to go for these positions because the computer will always tell you like white's, you know, better or winning. Of course, the material advantage is big, but is there a clear way to win? Like, for example, like, I don't know, something like this happens and let's say you lose one pawn. Are you still, are you still totally winning here? I mean, you're still better. 
But I don't know. But I don't know if Lay. She took the the F pawn, guys. She took the F pawn. Mm -hmm. Rook takes F7, King F7, Bishop C8 on the board. Wow. So, all right. B6. Um, I guess you don't have to do B6. I guess you can also do maybe King F6, Jen. Maybe you should improve your king because this move doesn't seem urgent. Well, what do you think? Maybe King F6 is the right way to yeah, do it. Yeah, King F6 looks like a, a smart move. Yeah. Actually, put the king on e5. I don't know, Jen. Like, I'm I'm curious to see what Lay's got here because it's not like it's so obvious that you're winning after king f6. Oh, maybe we were wrong about rook e6, Irina. <laughs> she should have found it. Wow. I mean, that's going to be crazy. I mean, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> no. Anna saves this endgame down two pawns. But like, I'm I'm serious, Jen. Like, I'm not impressed about about where white's pawns are like they are not going to be easy to advance and i mean if the king gets there you're you're gonna have to find something like really special to win you know good luck with that well let's see if she plays that move f4 where did she play i do think she, maybe she played your move king f6 let's see b6 no, she actually she played, played b6. b6 she actually unfortunately play, she's actually unfortunately playing the first move i suggested which is b6 i i think this would have been um, you know, a more safe move because this one actually gives F4 ideas. Now, I don't know, I don't know why Anna decided to, to allow that, but we did see that, you know, this, just because this is an idea doesn't mean it wins. It's just that it looks quite promising for white in the beginning. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Just, uh, creating yeah. that extra, extra pass pawn. I mean, it would be such a blow to lay if she didn't win this game. It really would be. It would be cra a crazy blow. So I, I still think she will. Yeah, I still think she will. Yeah. She still think she will but I still think she will. But there's about a zero percent chance that that Anna's Muzichuk is resigning. I mean, you know, she's going to make it to the time control before resigning. So oh, that I, there shows. I'm going to I'm going to yeah. go I go out I don't on a limb. I don't know. Should I go? I mean, I just feel like this is the best position Anna has had in a while. So, I mean, at least the trend is going in a decent way for her, like in the sense that I, um, okay, so Bishop F5, so white, what is the concept though to win? That's what I want to know. Like, okay, obviously I see your move doesn't really do anything. I guess you're just restricting my knight. Okay, cool. Still, still to play F4, I think, and play D6 and create the two passers. Hmm. I think it's still, the, are you, so you were about to predict a draw, Irina? uh was i about to predict it I'll, I'll go and predict it go i fine i mean no one's gonna kill me if i get it wrong so i guess I will predict it. <laughs> no it is not the squid chess games absolutely not so um the yeah i think is was king f6 played no no she's still but thinking it's just my and, my idea yeah. so how are you gonna play after king f6 jen okay so if d6 you play your king's locked out. Yeah. So, that's or true. you're going to wait for me to play d7. Yeah, actually, that is annoying. I, I hate that you can do that. Because you can't play king e5 because I just played d7. Right? Well, then you have knight b7. Okay, so it's it's not totally over. Yeah, right? yeah it's not totally over. But my knight can't, like, oh, this is getting bad. No, I I don't think I'm going to be. Um, yeah, I don't think I'll be, I'll be predicting a draw here, John, because unfortunately... I don't have, you know, I didn't get a blockade on the pawns. That's the problem. Well, the thing, well, what, what are you worried yeah. about, about King E? What about the King well, let me, E5 let me, idea, let me put though. it to you this way, Jen. Like, one second. Just one little thing, right? Like, if I was able to get my king here the way I wanted to, then I think that there is some work. Because, I mean, my whole intention was that your pawn was never going to move, right? Now, now with B6 being played, um, okay, maybe I should do King E7, but that that does take maybe a move longer. But maybe... I will I will go for the F4 idea then, though. Right? Yeah, I mean, I definitely like then... E6 for White. Like the White should get that pawn probably as far as they can, just to totally limit my pieces. She played King F6, by the way. Yeah, well, I do think D6 is, is going to happen um, because she's not just going to let Black's King go to E5 for free. If you if you like go there in this position, this is the kind of position where I was thinking that black could have some drawing chances, right? So, like that was the, that was the goal, but, but you know, D six is not the same at all because once you get your pawn there, like my pieces are. I think the problem is at some point I play F four check, give up my pawn, move my Bishop away. And then you, you're, you're left to deal with the G and the D. 
Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, and, and that's what's going to happen here, too, because if you look at d6, knight b7, d7, mm. you could put your king on e5. But what I, I'll have to do is I'll put my king on like e3. And yeah, though, actually, it's tricky for you to play a four, though, because now my king controls it. And if your king goes there, OK, I'm taking with check. So, OK, true, maybe it's not true. a big deal. Maybe you go back to f3. So you exactly. You can, yeah. But let's see. She that would be my idea d6 on the board. So that move these makes me sad. Yeah, that move is like, it's very powerful. 48 seconds left for Anna Muzichuk now. So she's going to be playing um, knight b7, most likely forcing d7. She could play king e5 right away as well. Yeah. Also forcing d7. And then. Yeah, I feel, I feel like Anna just got a bit depressed about her position. I mean, understandably so. And the reason I, my clue to that, guys, is, is actually this move b6. Because even though it was my first instinct, like, I mean, positionally, of course, you want your pawn there, but you just, it's its not urgent. And it definitely is like, I think if Anna was thinking with a clear head, I mean, she would obviously know that like improving her king and at least trying to get it there is like a better idea. Now, I don't know if king f6, maybe there was, maybe there was still this d6 thing, right? But for some reason, it wasn't quite as good. Yeah, we looked at that. It wasn't quite as good as the way that Alay has it right now. And um, the fact that she went with b6, allowing that bishop to improve and letting that pawn in, I mean, it does make me think that, you know, she just got down about her position. And here we are, king e7, Lei Ting Che to play. Um, we're thinking f4, g takes f4, come up with the king and catch that pawn, protect, perhaps take the h4 pawn as well, and then they're just going to be rolling. The pawns will roll. Yeah, f4, just go for it. You know, pawn takes, king f2. I mean, blacks, blacks, king and knight cannot do anything here. You're just going to go. Yeah, this is painful. This is painful for Anna. Magician531 says, no, I just got here, and I was rooting for Anna to be the next world champion. I love her from her streams. I guess I have to root for chess queen now. Wow, that's another great woman to root for. She's... He's, of course, referring to Alexander Kostanyuk, who will be playing in Uzbekistan in the other part of this bracket um, that will also include Goryo Chikina. But let's yeah. see, as the game is approaching the time control, we saw F4, G takes F4, King F2. Yeah, all of that. Is, well, yeah, F4 is on the board and King F2 is on the board. I think she's going to have to try to protect this pawn with the king. And then, like, settle with her knight to d8 and back and forth. Hmm. Still, I mean, knight d6. Oh, knight d6. Knight oh d6 she wants to take happen. that pawn. That's right. And so she's playing. <clears throat> yeah, she's yeah playing. it doesn't really do anything. I mean, king f3, knight takes, I take. I mean, my my pawns are better, and I, I have a bishop on the board. So, unfortunately, knight d6 is not going to stop that move. Does not look like it's going to save the day. Knight d6, king f3 played. Yeah. Well, hmm. really good. Really good game by Lei overall. What can I say, Jen? Yeah, fantastic um, performance. Cannot take anything away from, from her play. Nope. And whoever plays her next is certainly gonna have a force to be reckoned with as uh this uh this play just does not leave you feeling confident any any player playing as Lei Ting Che is know that they're up against a beast um because she's just so good at all the different stages I mean this opening prep is very adroit and then it seems like she's got very fine positional composure and obviously has tactical acumen as well so uh yeah just uh young player in great form um who's inching closer to potentially playing for that world yeah. championship crown all right well um yeah it's sad guys that we're not going to see a um a tie break tomorrow i feel a lot of sadness on anna's face right now as well not sad um, for Leighton J. she's happy about it <laughs> yeah but uh, we got anna's face here in the video and yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I see, you know, kind of uh, 
probably close to, close to tears or, you know, crying inside. Yeah. Um, it's, it's rough guys. She's a, she's a great fighter and, um, well, you know, but look at lay lay is looking so determined, you know, so determined. Serious. Yeah. She's not relaxed at all, but just looks like, okay, that's it. I'm going for the kill now. That's the way to be, you guys. If you're winning a game, don't relax until the game is over. Many a game has been ruined by relaxing too soon. We have Jeffrey back in the chat, and he says, love you, Lay, Big J. So he's a fan. He's excited to see this. I mean, you know, I, I will say if it's mm. going to end without a tiebreak, let it be in the beautiful game. And this was a really beautiful game that gave us a lot of instructional lessons and a lot of beautiful moments, right? Like, uh, you know, whether it was rookie six or the night D five idea earlier, very nice, nice tactics in this game. Yeah, no, it's a good game <clears throat> by lay for sure. And, uh, I guess we're getting close to that, to the end. So now what happens if she takes the Bishop King takes King D seven. Oh, I think just King G six, Jen, or yeah she's way ahead in the race to promote the pawn unfortunately um you can just i mean if you go there the king tries to stop it and then you just go here and black's pawns are nowhere nowhere near as fast as you can see so white wins so you can't even take the the bishop which means that um well i mean that's it it's, it's over i mean i think anna can honestly just resign around this point because g g6 is coming um you know she also can win that pawn king g4 next maybe uh well okay she'll yeah. probably play like b5 or something she'll probably she'll probably still play place a few moves by the way jeffrey sean back in the chat saying that he really feels for anna so much hard yeah. work and it all comes to an end here he says that he would cry if he lost this game yeah. Well, it's never shameful to cry. I mean, sometimes we need to do it, um, whether we're five years old or 50 years old or in Anna Muzuchuk's case, I think she's 30, 29. Um, 32. So, yeah. Um, that uh, 32, you said? Yeah. And mm -hmm. her sister's, I think, a year younger, right? Yeah, a year yeah. or two younger, yeah. Yeah. But uh, in any case, this is certainly very, very tough moment for Anna Muzuchuk, who's been so high rated, you know, like I think she was the third or fourth female player ever to cross the 2600 barrier, right? After Yuda Polgar, after Humpy Canera, yeah. and after Ho Yifan, she was the, the fourth one to do it. And yeah, you know, this world championship, however, has eluded her graphs. Her sister has held the crown, Maria Muzichuk, but Anna Muzichuk has never done that. And of course, a very difficult times, you know, for Anna Muzichuk, who hails from. Ukraine, if you see the Ukrainian flag, it's been very, um, you know, difficult, difficult couple of years for, for almost everyone. But between the pandemic and the, the war and the, the aggression in Ukraine, this is, uh, you know, such a parallel story here for her to try to be playing for her first Women's World Championship story. But it's not going to happen because she's going to lose this game and it's going to be Lei Ting Shea who's going to be on that road potentially. Yeah, yes. Marie is 30 and mm -hmm. um and Anna is 32. That's right. So sisters. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely difficult I think to to focus on chess, you know, with um the situation in in her country and I'm not even sure like are they living at home in the Ukraine or are they um trying to spend more time in Europe because, you know, obviously it's not a hundred percent safe, even though they're from Western Ukraine, the city of Lvov, and it's generally is not getting bombed, but it's sort of like the transit point for a lot of people from Ukraine who are trying to go over to Poland. Um, and so it's got, it's got a lot of refugees, you know, so I don't know if they're there or if they're, they were preparing for this tournament from Europe. Um, but in any case, I mean, it's definitely, you know, it's been a difficult yeah, time for all Ukrainian players in the last, uh, you know, half a year. 
That's right. Living in Spain, apparently, at the moment. I think I heard that somewhere as well. But of course, I'm sure I have family and friends still in Ukraine. And um, a lot to think about beyond the chessboard, um, for sure. Oh. Well, the Ukrainian team did win the gold medal at the Olympiad. So I think that provided um, a big boost for, for um, Ukrainian morale. And I think all the girls were just really happy that it worked out that way. Right, she is wearing the yellow sweater, by the way. That's yellow and blue of the Ukrainian flag. Actually, together, they're wearing yellow and blue. Yeah, it's interesting how, you know, Jen, like as commentators, we really enjoy watching the battle, right? And it just feel, even though we're not like the, the players themselves, but it feels sad when it comes to the end. You kind of like just want, you just want the story to keep going, right? That's right. I mean, you would love it if both players could win, but that's not the way it works. You got to have one win. Now, speaking of that, Lei Tingche winning this game, suppose um, Guryuchkina wins the other bracket. Based on mm -hmm. the way she's playing now, um, who, would you, who would be your pick as a favorite? Because Guryuchkina has been, been higher rated, 40, 40 points maybe. Yeah. But uh, Lei Tingche has just been so impressive in this match. I, I, I mean, what would you say? Who would you pick if you had to pick? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Jen, actually, anyone who winds up winning both matches is going to be a good player because no one wins by accident, right? So I think um, I think it's, it would be just a very close match, you know, and in terms of ratings, it's not a big difference. I think, um, yeah, that's, I mean, I can't really pick pick a side. I think it would be that um, that close. Yeah, I mean, with the absence of Ho Yufan in the tournament, it's hard to think of any kind of matchup where there would be a big favorite, you know, even all the way to the, yeah. the final, you know? That's, I don't think like a 40, 50, 50 point gap in rating is that is that significant. Um, that cannot be overcome by, you know, good preparation, good form, right? Like if you're talking about, let's say, 100 points in rating, then you start to guess, then there is a difference. Um, it, it starts to come up, right? For sure, like if you're talking like 2480, 2580, yes, it's there. But 50 points, in my opinion, is just not um, something where I'll be calling a favorite just based on that. And don't forget, she is going to be winning points with this game. So mm -hmm. this is a classical rated game. She's going to be winning rating points. I think she's going to be potentially at her peak or her close to peak rating at almost 2545. She'll be inching her way up to that coveted 2600 barrier. Maybe she can join that 2600 club that you know only uh, five or six women have ever ever been over. Um, it's also yeah, Gadyashkin also high. hasn't really played a lot this year, right? I mean, I think it's just it's hard now for the Russian players to to play, and I can't really recall any major events that Gadyashkin has played. And maybe she's just preparing for uh, this tournament. Oh so yes, I love. Olive mm -hmm. Mikon 33 says it's not clear. It's not even that clear that Guryuchkina will win Pool B. Absolutely. I was just picking a hypothetical because she's the highest rated player in Pool B. But Lei Ting Che is like playing so well that even in that matchup, we couldn't really pick a favorite. But uh, yeah, of course, um, that that pool will be hotly contested as well. Uh, Lano, Kostin Yu. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just... Which player am I missing there? Um, Tang Zhang Zhen Yi. Yeah. She played in the Russian Super Final. Yes, Magician 531. Was that, was it this year? I mean, it wasn't last year. She played in it also this year. Oh, Somehow I can't. It's kind of blurring. Time is blurring, isn't it, a little bit? Yeah. Huh? I, I mean, mean, I know she played in a Russian Super Final. I thought it was like, Two years ago, maybe, me yeah. yeah. The one that is memorable to me was, I think it was like last year, but was there also one this year already? I don't even know well, who, who who won it then. The Russian Super Final, I don't have any clear winner in my mind, like of, of, a, of, a, of someone who won it. So that's why, I don't know, maybe you could let us know about that. Um, but you also let us know that she also played in the Women's Grands Prix that was won by Logno. Interesting. I, that one I remember. And I somehow I didn't remember Lay's games from that event, but okay. Um, King E5. So she decides uh, she's going to play 
So I don't know, put her opponent into Zugzwang, perhaps just promote the pawn like that. And I think that's the plan, Jen. Um, I was thinking that she would go the slower way and go and win the pawn, but she decides that this is perfectly winning. All right, so, oh, no, there's a white king on e4. Is there a resignation? And it looks like there must have been. They just, oh. yes, that's right. Anna Musutik has resigned, and it looks like Lei Ting Che has won this match. She will advance to the semifinals. She will get guaranteed 50,000 euros. Huge congratulations. What a performance. Great games. I mean, honestly, when you look at that game and you look at the mistakes that Anna made, they were not obvious. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we had a computer assistant. They were showing us these crazy lines that Anna could have played to maintain equality. And yeah. it, it just, just goes to show you this was all, all about the great play of, Ling, of Lei Ting Che, not as much about Anna's poor play. And that's why um, frustrating. She's Yeah. I, of course, you know, we all feel for someone who just kind of got stopped in their goals. Um, it's a very, very bad feeling to have things come to an end. And lay it's the best possible feeling you won you avoided a tie break you uh reached the, you know your goal of qualifying to the uh finals match against whoever wins pool b and and then it's all over like it's, it's you know you can just basically enjoy monaco for the last couple of days that you're there so it's really a perfect ending for her i think looking back on this match i guess i would say we didn't really see Anna um, in her fully aggressive mode, I think, I mean, these games, Jen, um, that she actually showed more against Humpy, or at least certainly, like, I guess I didn't get to see the form that she was in against Humpy in the fourth game, right? Like, when she, when she was in a must-win situation, and you could feel that, and she tried so hard to win, she ultimately did. And also, she was, you know, playing quite aggressively in the tiebreak games, I don't feel like she gave herself a chance to play that way so much. And maybe looking back on this match, maybe that's going to be her takeaway point is that, you know, I should have tr probably tried to stay true to my style, play more exciting positions because all these technical positions um, didn't really, didn't really produce the results I wanted. That's right, Anna Muzuchuk, with a lot to think about. Well, Li Teng Che has a lot to prepare for, as she knows that she will be facing one of the Titans in the other bracket, um, playing in Uzbekistan in a couple of weeks. Um, Li Teng Che will be waiting to find out who that is. Here is the bracket. Gorgeous Kina is going to be playing Kostin Yuk in the first round. Lano against Zhang Ji Tan. And the winners of those two respective matches will play the for the semifinal spot, for the chance to play Lei Ting Che, the winner of that will go on to play Ju Wen Jun at some point in 2023 for the title of Women's World Champion. It's been a delight, Irina, to call this game with you a thrilling Grunfeld and to watch Lei Ting Che make it happen and advance to the semifinals. It's also been a pleasure um, to be on both Chesscom Live and Chesscom earlier in the day. Um, with uh, our wonderful audience and all the great moderators and our producers. Um, what a great team. Jen, let us also let the viewers know about the Collegiate Chess League. Individual season has begun. Um, it's reached the playoffs after six weeks of regular season matches. And it's the first time that the Collegiate Chess League has done an individual season with college students of all levels or presenting their schools and battling their rivals so look at that it's a nice prize fund of twenty thousand dollars and um the matches are held on november 5th 12th and 19th so that's coming up guys you can watch that on chess.com it's a new event i have never heard about it before but that's really cool a league for college chess players um we didn't have that when we were mm, in school and finally, guys, we have the Global Chess Championships. We are in the uh, semifinals. Naka versus Wesley So, uh, Nihal Sarin versus Anish Giri. I'm sure you guys would love to watch that now. It's, uh, it's in progress. So we're going to wish you a great weekend, Jen. It was a pleasure. And congratulations to Lei Qingji. And we will see you guys in some events shortly.
Bye, everyone. Thank you.